wrap up, turn in this book this week, and it is the end of the beginning of your study of the Bible. Okay. Uh, as I mentioned at the BCC last week, whenever you turn in a book, right, you've just begun to study that book. And the wonderful thing about SBS, uh, as you have come to learn, is that this is a survey course. <laughs> right on the front end, you're like, I can't wait to go deep in SBS. It's going to be great. And then you get to SBS, and you're like, yeah, there's no time to do any of that. <laughs> but now, at this point, you come to the end of the school, and you have a foundation to approach everything in the Bible, which is amazing. Um, the ability to go back to any chapter in the Bible and have at least a vague idea of what is going on and the ability to be able to engage with every chapter of the Bible because you've studied it, because you know the literature, because you have a little bit of the context is, is amazing. Uh, it is really, really rewarding. And I've talked enough about um, all that you will be after SBS and the Bible people and uh, your understanding of it and that kind of stuff. But uh, yeah, it really is a tremendous thing. And so I'm excited for the lecture today as we finish out the book of Matthew. Um, before you is a sticky note. Uh, and <clears throat> let's just take a second to respect the genius of sticky notes. <laughs> <laughs> the fact that this note has glue on the back but doesn't leave glue on the next sticky note is yeah. genius. Uh, it is wow. absolutely true. genius. Awesome. Yeah, that's right. true. Um, okay, side note. Right. So, um, what I want you to do is take a second, I want you to write down what is the Lord speaking to you through the book of Matthew, and then put that on the first page of the book of Matthew, so that the next time you come to this book, you remember what God was speaking to you last time. Just take a couple minutes. So the rest of the book of Matthew, we've got chapters 16 through 28 to finish out today. Um, the 
a lot of what happens in Jerusalem is pretty consistent in the Synoptic Gospels. So we may touch on a couple of things, but I don't know if I'll spend as much time on that as other portions of the book today. But we'll finish it out. So here's a little bit of a map of uh, northern Israel. We get the Sea of Galilee here and some of the routes that Jesus is walking uh, when we see chapter 15 and 16. So in chapter 15, Jesus is in the regions of Tyre and Sidon, which are up here. That's where he meets the Canaanite woman. Okay, And then we know that he goes to Caesarea Philippi. So it's likely that he just moves, at least according to Matthew's geography, that he moves from Tyre over to Caesarea Philippi. And Caesarea Philippi, as you can see, is at the base of Mount Hermon. Uh, Mount Hermon is the source of the Jordan River. Uh, and there is some um, significant lore that, uh, or one of the sources, as you can see, is significant lore tied in with um, spiritual darkness and spiritual warfare in Israelite, um, uh, Israelite kind of theology. <clears throat> Here is a picture of the base of Mount Hermon today, um, where it's right near Caesarea Philippi, and that's probably where Jesus is at. This is, as you can see, there's a number of ruins here, and then there's a cave that is kind of this um, cropped out area, and this is what it would have looked like in the time of Jesus. So, So, um, <clears throat> this is the temple of the god Pan, and Pan is a half goat, half man, and the god of panic and fright. And then the smaller temple is the temple is a temple to Zeus. Okay. So this is the context here that we're looking at. And we'll kind of see um, how that plays into this. But uh, <clears throat> this is about 25 miles north of Galilee, uh, one of the sources of the Jordan River. And it was believed in Israelite kind of theology that Bashan, this area, and this made up the, the northernmost part of Old Testament Bashan, that this was the gate of the underworld. And you kind of get this in Psalm 68, where God, or Yahweh, is triumphing over the powers of evil at Mount Bashan, or Mount Hermon. And it's the same location here. And so Jesus is in the same place, and when he says something along the lines of, um, on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it, it's in the exact place where they had thought there is the gate of Hades, or the gate of Sheol, the underworld in Israelite thought. <clears throat> so um, Jesus is saying that in light of the Greco-Roman context and the Israelite context here. So uh, at the beginning of this chapter, though, the Jesus confronts the Pharisees, and that is going to lead into kind of the question that Jesus is going to ask to his disciples. At the beginning, he will confront them in saying, you know, the Pharisees, can recognize the signs of the weather. They can see when it's going to snow, and they can see when it's going to rain, but they cannot recognize the coming of the Son of God. And that is a, obviously a big confrontation and a, a big uh, call to attention for all Christians because they have to be aware of the signs of the times, which is what Jesus will then hit on in chapter 23 as he's talking about this situation coming to Jerusalem. So they see the signs of the times, uh, see the signs of the weather and the world around them, but they miss the signs of the times. And <clears throat> so that leads Jesus into a warning for his disciples to be aware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Uh, and we talked about this at dinner with a couple of us. Um, I thought it was in chapter 15. It is right at the beginning of 16, so um, end of 15, basically. And the... Uh, the removal of leaven was a common practice for the Jews. Every single year, they would remove, remove all the leaven from their house, which means all of their sourdough starters, because they don't have packs of dried leaven, right? Everybody has a sourdough starter in their home. And so remove all of your sourdough starters from your home. Um, any leavened bread, get that out, uh, and purify your home. And so leavened bread, had, I mean, was characterized as this kind of acceptable, easy to eat, and like... Elias said yesterday, it's the difference between eating a, um, like a cracker and eating a pillow. You know, it's, it is, uh, the leavened bread is much nicer. It's much more palatable. But leaven became something associated with impurity, not just sin, but corruption, and a diluted message. 
And when we talk about diluted messages today, we don't use the term leaven, we use the term watered down. And so I've like, I like to think of this as Jesus telling his disciples, take the ice cubes out of your soda. Mm. You know, it might make it nicer, it might make it more it cooler, mm. but it will water it down and dilute the soda itself. And so that, that's the parallel Jesus is making. And so those kind of things that make things a little bit more palatable, a little nicer, but symbolize kind of corruption or watering something down and diluting the message. Jesus warns his disciples against that, to not let those things creep into their lives. And that is quite an uh, important message, considering the fact of what Jesus is about to say about being the Christ. Right? He, they can't let the cultural perspectives of their day dilute or corrupt their perspective of who, what Jesus is going to do. Mm-hmm. And right now, it is. Right now, their, their mind has the, quote, leaven of the Pharisees of what the Messiah was supposed to be like. And Jesus is going to show them what the scriptures have said and reveal to them uh, who the Messiah is supposed to be. So when Jesus takes his disciples to the gate of Hades, he's going to ask them, well, what do people say about me? Who do they say that I am? <clears throat> and yeah, I love in Matthew's gospel the disciples' response. Well, some people say John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah. And those are some mean dudes. <laughs> They're not the kind of guys that you cuddle up to at night, right? Jeremiah, let me tell you about my feelings. You know, um, just give me a word of comfort. No, Jeremiah's not like that. Elijah is not the guy to do that, right? And when you think of Jesus, that can often be the picture you think of, right? We, we portray him as just the good shepherd, where he has a, a lamb that he's coddling in his arms and he's taking care of it. But we often don't portray Jesus as the Matthew chapter 23 calling down, um, calling out the Pharisees, and then chapter 24 calling down fire on Jerusalem and the temple. Now, that wouldn't get as many likes on Facebook or Instagram <laughs> as the Good Shepherd. So uh, that's who people. But that's who people thought he was. Why did they? Why did they think that? Well, <clears throat> I think because the message he's preaching, but also there, whatever it was about him that. The disciples thought he was going to be the Messiah. There had to be something more to him, right? To see him and think, this guy can be the next king of Israel. Mm-hmm. right? He's, he's not just some... Um, I mean, we've got to be careful how we paint him in, in our own lenses. That When we think about him, we've got to think of a person that other people thought could be the king. Could be a political leader who overthrows a Roman military and leads a revolutionary coup against the present government. So whatever we think about him, we have to portray Jesus in the perspective that they would have thought about him or seen him because that's how they think about him here. Well, that, of course, leads them to saying, Peter saying, on behalf of the disciples, the representative of all the disciples, you are the Christ. And that is a huge confession. Mm -hmm. But not the confession that Peter thought he was making, (laughs) as we know. And the words that come out of his mouth might be true, and Jesus affirms the truthfulness of those words. But he doesn't affirm the orientation or, or the origin of that thought, right? But the, the, what that, those words represent. <clears throat> and, of course, he says uh, that only my Father in heaven has revealed this to you, right? It's not just your own thoughts. It is, it is the leading of God. But you have misunderstood it, which is kind of how it's gone with a lot of the religious leaders. Is like, well, sure, he's the Christ. And we recognize he has this connection to the fulfillment of prophecies and this kingship, all these kinds of things, but he's not the one we want him to be, and so they denounce him because of that. <clears throat> Jesus will say that he's going to uh, build his uh, church on this rock. Now, there's a couple thoughts on what that rock is. Um, it has been linked with Peter in the past. The word Petros uh, means rock, and so it is thought that, well, was it, the, was it Peter the confessor who the church is built upon? Which is kind of where the Catholic, where Catholics have gone, um, where classically all of us would have bent towards until about 500 years ago, and that's where we would have leaned. Um, now we would look at it and say, well, it's probably the confession of, Je- of Peter, that Jesus is the Christ. But even more than that, if you think back to chapter 7, what was the rock that the wise person built on? Jesus and his life, his mm-hmm. teachings, all that he was. And that is what Jesus is building, saying he's building on here. Well, what is the church? If we think about the church throughout the rest of the New Testament, the church is not just a building, it is a people. And that people represent the temple of God. 
And so there was another significant temple built upon a rock in Jerusalem. The temple was always talked about as having been built on the rock in Jerusalem. And that rock was the rock that um, Isaac was almost sacrificed on or thought to be. Right? So there is that connection there between the Jerusalem temple and the rock it was built on. And now Jesus as the rock that the temple will be built on, which is his church. So those parallels are things we want to pick up on uh, here with what Jesus is saying. Of course, Jesus will uh, rebuke Peter in the very next section because Peter does not want Jesus to go and die. A Messiah doesn't do those type of things. A Messiah goes and wins. But that's not Jesus' avenue, right? Jesus is on the road to crucifixion. <clears throat> and he calls his disciples to follow him in the same way, to count the cost and to and to take up their cross with them. Of course, that is a confusing message to pretty much anybody who's yeah. following Jesus, <laughs> is why would we do that? You know, that is not the expectation. So, after that very confusing moment, I mean, I can imagine for the disciples how uncomfortable they would feel about Jesus. Like, he's gone from being the guy who you're like, yes, this is the guy, he's the Messiah, we think he's the Christ, now you're kind of like, well, what is he talking about? You know, and Peter, James, and John follow him up the mountain of transfiguration in the next chapter. And on this mountain, which we don't know if this is Mount Bashan, um, if Jesus hasn't moved geographically, then this could be Mount Hermon, um, which could then make that connection with Psalm chapter 68, leading the host of captives in a triumphal perception, procession up Mount Bashan, uh, sorry, up Mount Bashan. <clears throat> and so there could be that connection there. Um, other people will link it to a mountain in Galilee, which is commonly referred to as the Mount of Transfiguration, um, tr or traditionally. But we don't know for sure which one it is. But anyways, he's up on the mount, and this moment for Jesus is, we don't want to think of it as the revelation of his deity but the revelation of his glorious humanity. Why? Well, we can look at it and see, well, he's shining like a star, right? He's glowing like God. Well, in Luke's account, Matt, uh, Moses and Elijah are also glowing. So does that make them deified also? No, absolutely not. We would never jump to that conclusion. Or in chapter 13, verse 34, of, or 1343 of Matthew, Jesus says, all of those in the kingdom will shine like stars. So, this is more, seems to be probably more a link to Jesus' glorious humanity than it is the revelation of his deity. And the irony is, and the puzzle that is for us, just as much as the early church, is that they looked at the cross as the revelation of Jesus' deity rather than the transfiguration as a representation of his deity. And that is a puzzle that uh, they, they were aware of as well. And they thought, you know, we've got to deal with this, that God would die for us. <clears throat> now, the, the parallels of the crucifixion and the transfiguration can't be missed. Uh, the fact that both of them take place in a mountain environment. Um, Jesus here is revealed in glory, and there on a hill outside of Jerusalem, uh, he is revealed in shame. Here his clothes are turned white, there his clothes are stripped off and soldiers gamble for them. Here he's flanked by Moses and Elijah, two of Israel's most prominent figures in their history, and there he is flanked by two brigands, two robbers who have demonstrated how far Israel has fallen away from the graces of God and how far they have gone in rebellion. <clears throat> in here, there's a bright cloud that overshadows the scene, and there, there is overwhelming darkness. Peter will blurt out here how wonderful it all is, and there he will hide in shame as he has denied his Lord. And so there is these clear uh, state uh, clear connections, I think, between these two events. Now, Jesus is up on this mountain, and we want to connect it as well, like we've done with other mountain moments in this book, but Jesus is with important mountain figures. Right? Both Moses and Elijah appeared on Mount Sinai, or, sorry, went to Mount Sinai, um, and met with God there. <clears throat> we see also Moses going up on a mountain when he dies, Elijah uh, fighting uh, against the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel, so there's a lot of connections with mountain moments here. <clears throat> and the primary thing I think that 
should be noted for us in this event is that Jesus is affirmed in his identity. That's the, that's the real big deal about the Mount of Transfiguration. More than who he is seen as in his revelation of his glowing um, figure, that Jesus is seen as the Son of God. And that is the, the affirmation of who he is, which points towards then what uh, Peter has said that was revealed from the Father, that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and then also uh, an affirmation of what he will come to do, that uh, as the Son of God, he will die on behalf of the world. So all of this together um, is such a profound revelation on the mountain that Jesus tells Peter, James, and John, you can't tell anybody until we come down from here. And uh, obviously, they're confused by it. They don't know why. Um, they're asking, well, what about Elijah and all this stuff? Because now they've come to the realization of who Jesus is. Right? They have a fuller understanding. Right? They don't understand fully, I think, the crucifixion yet, but they have a fuller understanding now of, okay, well, if you're this messianic figure, what about Elijah? That's where you get this conversation with John the Baptist and all of that. Uh, the story that is linked over each one of the synoptic gospels with the transfiguration moment is the deliverance of this demon, demonized boy that Jesus comes down the mountain and in each of the synoptic gospels he delivers a young boy uh, from a demon that the disciples are unable to deliver and that is just evidence of this triumph that he talked about in chapter 16 where he said the gates of hell will not prevail against this and now you see that exactly happening that at the revelation of his identity he comes down and delivers this boy and I think that G Peter, James, and John are experiencing firsthand the fulfillment of Jesus' work on the cross, or uh, work on the earth. <clears throat> and his statement to them at the end here, uh, For truly I say to you, if you have faith like a grain of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. And that's a, that's a big statement by Jesus. Yeah. Right, <laughs> That is a very big statement by Jesus. And what he is pointing to is that the secret is not the size of the faith. That is completely unimportant. The size of faith is absolutely negligible. What is important is the God in whom you believe. Okay. <clears throat> you can compare it to wanting to see the moon. You know, if you want to see the moon, the size of the window does not matter. What matters is the direction in which you face. So you can be looking out an enormous bay window in the wrong direction and you will never see the moon. But if you look out a tiny pinhole in the right direction, you can see the fullness of the moon. And it is the same thing with faith, that it is not about the size of the faith. It can be the smallest prayer to the one true God that can produce the greatest things. And elaborate devotion to a God of our own making or a God of our own ideal will be useless and sometimes worse. <clears throat> the following after this, Jesus uh, will predict his passion again. This is the second time, and we'll have the third time he does it in chapter 19, uh, or sorry, chapter 20, right before going to Jerusalem, where he will predict uh, his passion, the, going to the cross. And in less than 30 verses, Jesus has predicted his death and resurrection twice. And that, again, goes completely against our culture. And you see that with the language that Matthew puts into the hearts of the disciples. And they were greatly distressed. Um, this would be a, a fun Greek word for you to look at, maybe on your charts, and look at where it's used in other places in this book. Because this is a particular word that Matthew uses for the emotional response of listeners, uh, specifically the disciples here. And so I think you want to feel what the disciples are feeling. You know, when you see something like that, they were greatly distressed over Jesus and what he was going to do. They're going to find this again where they're going to be uh, greatly distressed when Jesus talks to them in chapter 26 about the uh, betrayal. Where you're going to see in verse uh, 26, 22, they were very sorrowful and began to say to him, one after another, is it I, Lord? So their emotional response to the realization of Jesus' death and resurrection uh, is profound for Matthew's Gospel. It demonstrates they, they don't have the full understanding of it. <clears throat> the last story here in this chapter is unique to Matthew, the temple tax story, where 
they come to collect the temple tax, uh, potentially from Peter and for Jesus here. And <clears throat> Jesus asks this question about Peter, or asks this question to Peter about whether we should pay the tax or not, whether it's right. And as the, uh, they tell this story, uh, Jesus says, you know, it's right for you to, to pay the tax. And depending on when the readers are reading this book, when it was originally written, can leave a dramatic impact upon their understanding of how to follow what Jesus is saying here. Okay? Before the fall of the temple, um, the temple tax was exacted from any, every Jewish man 20 years old and older. And it was a required tax every year for the general maintenance of the temple. Priests were exempt from this tax. And by the time of Jesus, so were some rabbis also exempt from this tax. <clears throat> and that might be something, you know, pre-fall of the temple that the church is having to consider, do we still pay this tax? Is something we still participate in? And it seems like Jesus is saying yes. But after the fall of the temple, this is even more profound, and I had mentioned this in brief last week, but after the fall of the temple, the Romans destroying the temple still demanded that all Jews pay the temple tax. And as they demanded that they pay the temple tax, the, those funds that were used for the maintenance of Jewish religious centers were instead confiscated by the Romans and sent towards the temple of Jupiter in Rome. And so through the payment of the temple tax, Jews were being forced to contribute to pagan altars. Right. And that is... I think they would have been wrestling with that. Do we as Jews reject the instigation of the Roman tax, or do we maintain our faithfulness to paying it? And I think Matthew advises the payment of the tax out of the respect of their overlords, which is what Jesus says here. You know, we do this because, you know, they're requiring it of us, even though we're sons and the sons shouldn't have to pay the tax. And so instead of um, enlisting further uh, reprival of Rome, further attacks upon them from Rome, they should pay the tax. And in so doing, maintaining a good testimony with their neighbors. So Jesus sets a wild standard here um, that would have, I think, been totally confrontational to any Jew who is debating whether they should pay the tax or not, especially those inside of the church. What was the god, the Rome god? The god of uh, God Jupiter. Jupiter. Yeah. Uh, the full name is Jupiter Capitolinus, so it's a capital and I-N-U-S. The second to last discourse, the kingdom discourse, <clears throat> focuses on community. So chapter 18, after Jesus has now gone through uh, chapters 14 and 15, we see kind of um, people's responses to Jesus, his feeding of the 5,000, feeding of the 4,000 and him meeting with Gentiles, and then he, his revelation of his identity in chapter 16, and that fullness then coming in chapter 17, the double passion prediction in these two chapters, and uh, the fullness of his kingdom coming in deliverance of this boy after coming down from the Mount of Transfiguration. So you see his kingdom beginning to come, and so now Jesus is saying, okay, well, how do we live inside of this kingdom? And he's going to pull out a few significant points, so we'll spend some time on chapter 18 here to look at how Jesus talks about how we should view each other. Okay, so a lot of chapter 18 is really interactions with one another and how we think of one another, how we think of community inside of the kingdom of God. And of course, while there are those elements in each one of the other uh, discourses, this one uh, very uh, specifically emphasizes the community nature. So <clears throat> the first question then is about who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And, you know, we might list certain names, maybe like Lord Cunningham or Bill Johnson a couple years ago. Not so much today, it seems like. Uh, Francis Chan uh, might be somebody who would say in the greatest in the kingdom of God. I mean, I'm just being honest here, you know, observational. Right? Um, you know, you, you can list any Christian celebrity that you think, and you say, man, they're, they're the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. That, that is the general perception of Christians. You know, oh, that person is the person I aspire to be like or sets the standard for everybody. But Jesus doesn't do that. Right? When he when he looks at who is the greatest, he doesn't think about who is the most famous. He doesn't even look at himself, right? He doesn't, it's like who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? You're like Jesus is, you know. He's, and you could be like, "Well, I am. Look, just look at me. I'm the greatest in the kingdom of heaven." Instead, he says, "Bring me a child." 
Now, I have been in enough YWAM meetings to know that there are mixed feelings on children in meetings. <laughs> The disciples had the same mixed feelings. Mm. When children came into the meeting, they were like, why don't you get those kids out of here? Just put them in the back. He'll talk to them later. Instead, Jesus says, let them come to me. Mm. Don't worry about it. You know, And that, I think, is so profound to me that um, it is, it's been a challenge to me. And even in my own life, like being willing to um, accept Alexander like coming up to me in the middle of a lecture, and everybody in the class is like, may, I don't know how they're feeling, but maybe some of them are like, oh, it's so cute. And other people are like, we're trying to learn the Bible right now. <laughs> and I'm like, and my thought is like, it's probably the same thing. The disciples, the Pharisees, the crowds probably have the same responses. There's people in the crowds who are like, oh, that's so sweet of Jesus. Look at him with those kids. And other people are like, we want to hear what Jesus has to say. And for the, the fact that Jesus does not... <clears throat> ever turn away children, but rather points people to confront their own value systems is huge. He doesn't ever say, well, bring the kids to me after I've finished my lecture. Once I've finished this teaching, then I'll, you can bring all the kids to me. It's in the middle of him, in whatever scenario he's in, where the people are around him, he says, let the kids come. Let the kids come. And he says, He's a calling a child into the midst of them. He said, truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbers, humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And we think about, and I don't know if I had mentioned this back in the spring when we talked about Mark, but we think about humility and we think about service and we think about lowering ourselves. And we often think about that as, you know, the humble will be exalted. Or you, you go low so you can be raised up. Kind of picture, right? We, we, I feel like that's the language I've heard for so many years. I don't know. I don't hear it as much. I'm not around um, training as much as I am the one training. So I don't know. But that's what I have heard. And that totally goes against what Jesus is saying. Mm -hmm. Jesus doesn't say the humble will be exalted in this world. He doesn't say you go low so you can have a position of respect and honor and fame in this life that going low is the exalted position. Being humbled is the place of honor. Right? That is the place of fame. Why, why do we know that? Why do we think that? Because that's what Jesus did. At no time does Jesus say, yeah, I'm humbling myself and serving you so that I can be raised up eventually. God sees my heart. <laughs> no, he says, the Son of Man came to serve, not to be served. Right. That is so confrontational, especially like, I mean, in the Greco-Roman world, children had much less value and much less rights than they do today. But children still don't have that much value in human society today. They're, they're honored, you know, they're valued, they're seen as human beings, but they're really not as valuable as adults, as contributing members of society, as a, excuse me, as a whole. Right. That's the general perception of children. And so for Jesus to take a child and say that if you want to enter the kingdom of God, this is what you want to be like. The one who has no status. We commonly think about it as the one who's innocently trusting in Jesus. Jesus is looking at the child and saying, look at what the way the world thinks about this child. You want to be somebody of no status, no honor so, uh, in the world's eyes. Everything that the world thinks is honorable, glorious, uplifting, exalting. Children are the opposite of that. And Jesus said, that is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Who thinks like that? <laughs> I mean, even among Christians, who thinks like that? Our Christianity is so influenced by the world to exalt and glorify people based off of the fame of their gift and their own ability and how much they can lead people well and their charisma from the front. Man, I, I don't want to be known for that. I want to be known as the guy who goes around and picks up everybody's trash in my classroom and washes everybody's mugs, puts away all the books, who does all the stuff that no one else wants to do. That's, that's to me, honorable before God. This right here, I'm helping people to understand that level of honor. Right? But that is the place of exaltation, not here in front of the room, not being flown across the world to teach. That is not the place of honor. The place of honor is in the lowest possible position so that when I'm at the hospitality house 
and I need to do laundry, I don't take the stuff out of the washer and the dryer. I move along the laundry and fold that laundry so that when the hospitality people come in, they have folded laundry in there, right? The position of going low and serving is the position of exaltation before God. I don't tell you guys that so you can think better of me, but to show you that even when I'm here teaching, it doesn't change. Do I clean my bathroom? Yes, I don't wait for people to come and clean my bathroom. <laughs> Do I take off all my, all my laundry? Do I clean the kitchen? Yes, because this is the place where I have come to serve. I haven't come to be served in this place. I've come to go low, right? And so that, for Jesus, he looks here and he says, the lowest person in your eyes, in, in your culture, that is the person that is the most exalted in the kingdom of God. That is a huge value system flip. And I don't think it can be emphasized enough because of how much we have emphasized the opposite. <clears throat> if there's one thing that we can, I think, really benefit from in YWAM is, is that the picture that uh, leadership, speaking, traveling, that is not the position where you should seek, right? That is not the position of honor it before God, right? That might be the position of honor before man, mm -hmm. but the position of honor before God is the low position. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and that's a, where Jesus continues on um, talking about children uh, in the next passages here. Uh, and temptation to sin, and how we need to be careful of uh, not leading one another to sin. Um, the uh, the next story here, the parable of the lost sheep, is one that Matthew or that Luke uses in accordance with the prodigal son parable, or the parable of the two sons in Matthew and the parable of the lost coin. He groups these together. Matthew takes this parable and puts it into community, and so rather than just you know, how God seeks out and includes all people in his kingdom. Now, Matthew is saying, you know, as the body of Christ, let us be those who, like Jesus, goes after the one mm -hmm. right? um, and value each individual. This is, uh, obviously, it's not a call to abandon the 99, but it is a call to recognize that everyone is valuable. Because, seriously, if a shepherd lost one sheep, it's like, so what? It's one sheep. And if it has a broken leg or if it is uh, injured, it's not worth the time to go and get that one sheep, right? Just economically speaking, mm -hmm. the, the danger of leaving 99 sheep in an open country and going to find one lost sheep, it is preposterous, which is why we read this parable and we're like, oh, that's so sweet of Jesus. Yeah, he goes after the one, right? <laughs> Everybody listening be like, that shepherd's an idiot, <laughs> right? Who would do that? Who would abandon their whole livelihood to go and find one sheep? God would. Wow. Right? That, it, uh, the parables are meant to be confronting, right? And if, if we read them and we're more comforted than confronted by them, we maybe have misunderstood them. <laughs> and this parable is the same thing. <clears throat> so it is the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of the, uh, that uh, it is not the will of my Father in heaven who, uh, my father who's in heaven, that one of these little ones should perish, is Jesus' conclusion here, is that of all of these, and, and in light of what Jesus has been talking about, he's referring to children still, right, referring to the least, the bottom of society, those who are of no status uh, and no honor. <clears throat> now, it, there is this interesting statement about, uh, I tell you that in heaven, their angel always see the face of father who's in heaven. Okay, well, what is up with that? Um, in the intertestamental period, there is this belief of the guardian angels associated with nations. And so um, that can begin to be associated with guardian angels over individuals. And so there isn't much said about it in the scriptures. In fact, this is really the only place that's talked about some kind of picture of guardian angels. So it's, we don't want to build too much theology off of that. But that, is, that could be what is being referenced here in light of Second Temple writings in Jewish literature. The next parable, or the next uh, instruction of Jesus will flow into the parable about forgiveness by, by Peter. So the next um, instruction is about confrontation, <clears throat> how to um, confront conflict in difficult situations in community. And 
Yeah, we like to think that we do this really well, according to Matthew chapter 18, or anytime conflict comes up, we commonly just instantly say, Matthew 18, you know, as though that, that we know what that is, but most of the time if someone is bringing up a conflict to us, they've already broken the Matthew 18 chain of process, <laughs> right? Because Jesus says the fr if you, there's a conflict with somebody, the first thing is to go to that person. Now, we can think of all sort of, sorts of contingent situations. And Jesus is not trying to be exhaustive. It's the same, I mean, it's the same kind of thing when you talk about divorce, okay? When Jesus says, you know, only um, by sexual immorality can there, is there permission for a divorce. Well, what if somebody's being abused in their household, you know? Jesus isn't trying to cover every single contingent in the situation, okay? But what he's trying to do is he's trying to lay a guideline that is the standard unless there is otherwise some kind of extreme circumstance, which is always how God has worked. Right, throughout the whole Old Testament, he's like, this is what I expect, and this is what I'm looking for. And then what you find is, well, there's an extreme circumstance, and God's like, okay, you know, the daughters of Zelophehad. had. Only men are to receive inheritance, and they're like, well, we have no brothers, and our dad died, so what do we do now? And God's like, well, have some land, you know? So, uh, <laughs> so, God, so there's, always these, there's always these exceptions. So we don't want to come to this place where we're like, it has to be this way. But we don't want to bring in so many contingents that we knock the, the rule off the table. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So this is the standard guideline um, that we want to follow. And that is to go to the person first, to um, address the issue or the problem with that individual first and foremost, and then to go to um, others with it. And these conflicts are things inside of the church. Okay, this is, this is stuff that is going on amongst believers and seems to be something that's repeated. <clears throat> Well, at the end of it, Jesus is saying, uh, if, if they continue in this way, continue in rebellion, then um, remove them from the congregation. Now, in our church setting, that is uh, very different than, uh, uh, than it is at Jesus' time, where to be removed from a church congregation was a huge deal, right? When there's only one house church in the city, right? It's not, you can't just go down the street to the next church, okay? It's a little more similar to YWAM. Now, uh, YWAM more reflects kind of monastic community, monasteries, where we are set apart living in extreme Christian community that is extremely close, and we live and cook our meals together, we work together, we worship God together, we pray together. We are essentially a monastery. Right? Um, and then we go out, we minister to the poor, and we reach the needy, and we do all the things that monks did in the Middle Ages, right? Yeah. It is basically the same thing. Um, we don't, we're, we look at ourselves, of course, in the missions movement, which is, it's just categorized differently today, but essentially that's like, it's like that. So why would more resembles that, the kind of situation of Matthew 18, hmm. where it's, if somebody continues in this way, at least in Kona, we end up coming to the point where we say, you cannot be part of our community anymore. You must leave. Um, and that there's through a long chain of process, but it's the same kind of thing where we can kind of just tell people, you know, Jesus loves you as you are which is true, but he doesn't want you to stay where you are, right? Jesus doesn't come to people and heal them and say, okay, great, hope you have a good life. You know, he heals someone, he says, go and sin no more. You know, he doesn't ever let people stay where they are. He always calls them higher. And that's, I think, this, this situation here. Well, that provokes Peter then to ask this question, well, should I just keep forgiving somebody? How much should I forgive somebody? Is forgiveness something I should just keep giving and giving and giving? And Jesus seems to be quite dre quite generous. Or, sorry, Peter seems to be quite generous. And right? he says, should I forgive him seven times? That seems quite generous to me. If somebody did something to you and they did the same thing again and again and again and again and again, and you forgive them seven times, yeah. you're like, dude, that was, you're, you're pretty godly. <laughs> <laughs> right? That is a big deal. And... Jesus comes back and he says, no, 77 times. Or it can be read uh, 77 times 7. And that, uh, what Jesus is emphasizing here is not that you should keep track. Right? But that true godly forgiveness is something that is continually released to somebody. It is a grace-filled forgiveness. It doesn't keep track of how many times forgiveness has been released. <clears throat> now, 
don't don't get me wrong on this. I don't think we should get Jesus wrong on this. That sin still has consequences. Okay, forgiveness does not mean forgetfulness. Okay, um, forgiveness is releasing that person from uh, from what you've held against them. Maybe the, the grudge or um, uh, holding holding something against them. But the uh, the consequences can still remain for somebody's sin. You know, for example, somebody who commits murder, even if they're forgiven, is still going to pay jail time or a prison sentence. But what we have to, I think what this parable teaches us and the story is teaching us is that um, from God's viewpoint, the distance between ordinary sinfulness, which is how we think of ourselves, and extreme sinfulness, which is everybody else, is like the distance between London and Paris, except from the viewpoint of the sun. Yeah. Right. That it is so close. And we tend to give ourselves so much grace or expect so much grace from others because we understand our heart motivation and when we mess up, we expect extreme levels of grace. But then to others, we don't get that same level of grace. And so Jesus then demonstrates that with a parable. Yeah. <clears throat> and so the, de- the call here is for reconciliation, for forgiveness, for continual um, restoration of relationships not seeking for revenge. So you get this parable, and there's a man who owes his master 10,000 talents. Okay, how much is that? That sounds like a lot of money, but how much actually is that? Well, 10,000 talents, uh, one talent is fi- equal to about 15 years' wages. That's the estimate. Okay, so that's how they kind of categorized it. 15 years' wages is one talent. And we mentioned last week, 10,000 is the largest single um, counter in the Roman numeral system. And so this is the most of the most. Talent is the largest amount of money they had categorized. So you would say um, you had two talents instead of like 30 years wages, for example. And so talent is the largest amount of money and 10,000 is the largest amount of time, right? Or largest amount of um, counting. So you've got 10,000 talents. This is 150,000 years wages. How many lifetimes would that be? 150,000 years wages. This insurmountable debt is supposed to shock the readers. When you come to this, this is supposed to feel like any other parable. Like, you've got to be kidding me. 10,000 talents, right? And when we look at this, how much money is that, though? Well, if we were to put it in kind of our modern day amount, this is about $3 billion, mm-hmm. or 2.5 billion pounds. Okay. Close to 3 billion Swiss francs. Okay. This is a huge amount of money. <laughs> I mean, $3 billion. It, to them, it, it is uncalculable. Okay. So the master comes to him and says, you're forgiven. Could you imagine three billion dollar debt, and it's just relieved of you? You're like, oh my god, it's the best day ever. You know? <laughs> there is nothing that compares to the feeling of having a three billion dollar debt lifted off of you. That's the same as like country's debt. Like the whole debt of a country is lifted off of that country. Then he goes and he finds a man who owes him how much money? A hundred denarii. Okay, how much is a hundred denarii? Well, one denarii is about one day's wage, and so 100 denarii is equal to about $5,000. Okay. This man who just had $3 billion forgiven of him will find a man who owes him $5,000 and throw him in jail because he will not pay him back. <laughs> it makes us laugh because it is ridiculous. And Jesus, that's what Jesus is trying to explain. So, all of this gets to the end. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. All of us have received the $3 billion forgiveness. The debt of our sin is that 10,000 talents debt. And then we go around and we hold our brother and sisters to their $100 or their 100 days wage debt. 
and we expect forgiveness from others. But in light of the forgiveness that God has given to us, it is foolish not to forgive others. <clears throat> and to think of all the sin that we have been forgiven and then to hold a grudge against somebody who used your toothbrush on accident <laughs> or stepped on your laptop on the floor. <gasps> well. Right. The people in the church uh, hold grudges against the pettiest things. You know, this could be things like food that was eaten out of the fridge, right? Or you took my last coffee pot. You know, and um, people will hold, and those are all silly examples. People hold unforgiveness over the most ridiculous things. And what Jesus is saying is that all of us have been forgiven a ridiculous debt, and we all need to be those who equally forgive those who don't have a ridiculous debt against us, something quite inferior. So this is this chapter is super confrontational <laughs> on like status, on confrontation and how we deal with it, and on forgiveness. Right? Those three elements uh, for Jesus uh, really give the baseline for Christian community. Who are the people of status in the community? How should we resolve issues amongst people who are sinners? And how long should we forgive them for? Now, all of those are, are quite striking confrontations for Christian community. And good things for us to think about as well. <clears throat> okay. Chapter 19, Jesus' journey to Jerusalem. Uh, I mentioned this quite briefly, and I don't know if we had talked about this before, um, but divorce in the first century Jewish world was, had two primary camps. One that was more liberal that viewed the possibility of divorce really for any reason that they so chose. And then you had a much more stricter interpretation on divorce in light of the Old Testament, which only allowed for divorce in cases of adultery. <clears throat> and so what the Jews are doing as they are going, or what the Pharisees and uh, religious, religious leaders are doing here is what they will do as soon as Jesus gets to Jerusalem, and that is trying to entrap him in uh, in a problem that he cannot explain. But what Jesus is going to explain is simply that divorce is not God's desire and it shouldn't be human's pursuit. Mm -hmm. And God doesn't give a provision for it so that man can figure out ways to get a divorce. He gives a provision because he realizes humans are broken. Mm -hmm. And while God's ideal is perpetual unified relationship, because that demonstrates the relationship of humanity and Jesus. He also recognizes that there is brokenness in humanity. And at times, there, is, there needs to be a provision for this relationship. So it is never God's desire. Right? But it is his understanding that it does happen. And you can think of <coughs> kind of you can think of this whole situation or divorce um, and the topics of, um, of this inside of Christianity as kind of like a, a car. You know, if you think of marriage as a car, uh, the designer of the car never expects the driver to get into dangerous situations with the car. But sometimes the weather is unexpected. And you get into situations in the car that are totally unexpected. How do you drive in a situation like this? And, in the driver's manual in the car, it instructs you on how to drive in certain weather conditions. They're not the expectation, and nor are they the hope of the designer of the car, but they are the reality of driving a car. And sometimes, while the, the manual in the car never encourages dangerous driving, it does give provision for what to do when you are encountering dangerous circumstances. So in the same way, does the Bible, while it does not encourage divorce, will give you instructions on what to do when you encounter situations that might require that situation or that uh, result. So it's the, the two grounds that are explicit in the scriptures is that um, divorce is permitted when an unbelieving spouse chooses to leave a believing spouse. And that is, that is one of them. So in that context, two unbelieving spouses have been married one of them gets saved, and the other one decides to leave the believing spouse. That is one uh, permissible circumstance. The other is, of course, the um, situation of adultery or sexual immorality. So, um, specifically, um, in the marriage context with another person. 
God's desire is lifelong marriage. That is the baseline. And that's, again, like what we should go for. Is that is, That's God's desire. That's God's baseline. Would Jesus have um, talked about other circumstances in which divorce may have been permissible? I do think so. It does not seem like um, abuse inside of the household is something that goes on inside the Jewish communities of the first century. Um, and I think the reason that is is because there is really no such thing as privacy until about a thousand years after Jesus, except amongst rich elites. Okay. Amongst commoners, Jews would live in households of roughly 40 to 60 people. Not in one room, but in a housing complex. Like this building would be a family, and you'd have 40 to 60 people living in this building together. Okay. And when you're in that kind of situation, you don't have the opportunities to beat your spouse. Right, because everybody else around you is going to stop you from doing that kind of stuff. So those kind of scenarios are so unfamiliar to the ancient context. And so when we discuss those things, we want to be aware of that. Now, what the disciples respond to this is, well, how can anybody be married then? If you can't choose when to get rid of your spouse, then how can you be married in the first place? Uh, and Jesus recognizes, um, or they recognize it as hard, right? It's challenging um, to... Uh, to <coughs> fully devote yourself to another person in this way. And it is, it is, it's not easy. Um, marriage just makes life more challenging, right? If you want to have a harder life, then you get married, right? Because <laughs> naturally, and I mean, it, it is the same pretty much for everybody. You're going to find the random cases of people who are like, it was the best thing ever and it totally made my life more wonderful. That is usually not the case. Usually, it challenges you. If you want, if you're like at the place where you feel like I'm pretty good in life, then get married, right? And then have kids. Um, it just gets more challenging. It, it adds more pressure onto life. There are more challenges because you have to learn how to work with another individual, right? And so there is the recognition. There's challenges. There's going to be there's going to be arguments. There's going to be uh, moments of conflict, and it is going to push you into deeper relationship with that person or farther away from that person, which is the sad reality that often happens. Um, in Christian community, we, we hope that through reconciliation, we get closer and closer and closer to one another. And that's the ultimate desire, right? Um, and don't get me wrong, it's not like it's something that's hard every day. But overall, it is, it face, you face different challenges in a marriage relationship than you ever do in a single relationship with other people. So the, I think Peter, <laughs> he's, he's the one kind of, you know, how can anybody uh, face the, the fullness of life with a spouse, right? If such is the case of a man with a wife, is it better not to marry? Okay. And uh, of course, that is not the case, right? Um, the the ideal is marriage inside of the Christian relationship. Yeah. I just have a question on that. Like Paul, he says it's better not to marry, though, right? So does he contradict Peter here? His advice. He, he says, "Me, not the Lord, mm -hmm. think it is better not to marry." But he recognizes that marriage is important, um, and he. Uh, but he he says, you know, my my opinion is in First Corinthians seven. So he's not speaking on behalf of God. In that, he makes very clear that he's not. So yeah. Okay. Um, I don't know about Paul. I think um, my personal opinion is that Paul was probably married before, mm -hmm. um, and either his wife died or divorced him. Um, or left him, or whatever the case was, um, and I think that his um, his statement then is don't get remarried. You know, like just continue to serve the Lord, devote yourself to service of God. I think that that is his stance. That's my personal opinion. Full interpretation, very speculative <laughs> on this side of things. People will land on both sides of it, but I think that that's it. I think it lends itself much more to that because all of you in this room who are single or uh, have, I mean, all of us have been single. If you're not right now, then you recognize that there's a lot of time spent thinking about your future spouse. So that whole thing of like, if you're single, you have your whole mind to devote to the Lord. You're like, well, what, what world are you living in, Paul? Because <laughs> <laughs> right now, I definitely don't think that. Way. <laughs> um, but I think Paul, after being married, would have realized actually now I do have my whole mind to devote to the Lord because I've I realized that area of my life. I don't have that desire anymore. So I think I think that knowing knowing single life, knowing married life, I think Paul had been married before. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Quick question as well. It says, let the one who is able to receive it, receive it. Yeah. Is that talking about being married or not being married? 
<laughs> I mean, I probably seen the reread it again, but. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, not everyone can receive this saying, um, but the, to the, uh, only to those whom it is given. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, it could be taken kind of either way in the context. Um, I, don't have a, I don't have a thought on it off the top of my head. Okay. No worries. I also have a question about the... The Unix? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually didn't, but... <laughs> okay, great. No, about the, the remarriage. Because you know, this passage is still often used for divorced people that they shouldn't get remarried because they then also commit adultery. But do you have any... Yeah. Um, yeah, honestly, I don't... I don't know where I land on it um, because of what I read explicitly in the scripture, but on the flip side of that, I don't think that there is uh, reason inside of the Christian faith not to um, because of the redemption of, of Christ, because of um, very different circumstances in our world today than there was in the ancient world. I don't think I think that is something that there is a, a cultural adjustment to be made, um, in my personal opinion. Now, um, how I would ground that, I would need to do more study on marriage and divorce in the, in, uh, the biblical text as well as the first century. But uh, I do think that there is, an, I wouldn't say there's as strict of a guideline upon it. Now, is remarriage of a divorced person going to keep them from heaven? Absolutely not. You know, does it keep them from a deeper relationship with God? I don't think so. Um, if somebody married a divorced person is... Um, is their status less in the kingdom of God? I don't think so. I, all of those kinds of things, I don't think there is. I just, um, but I do think, yeah, I don't, I don't have a place I land on it. So, yeah. So, yes, those are my thoughts. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, we'll take a break in just a second here. I do want to finish out chapter 19. So a couple of things here. The challenge of the rich young ruler that comes to Jesus, I think, should be taken in light of the story that Jesus has been talking about riches so often. And this story here provides another kind of question of, well, it's like, who can be married? And then you get another one of, well, who can enter the kingdom of heaven? You know, if the rich can't enter, if we can't divorce our wives, or that kind of thing. (laughs) So there's these questions the disciples are asking. And this rich young ruler who comes to Jesus is the only person in the whole Gospels who outright rejects a call of Jesus to follow him. And that makes Jesus sad. The only person in all of the Gospels? That outright rejects Jesus in a call to follow him. There's other people. You could perceive the person who Jesus says, follow me, and he says, well, can I go bury my father? And Jesus says, let the dead bury their dead. Well, you don't have any resolution with that person. So there's no other single individual who rejects a call where Jesus says the words, follow me. This is the only person. And that makes, uh, and that makes Jesus sad. We see, we know that Jesus is, is, uh, um, is bummed about this guy, not, not willing to follow him. And why is that? Why is he not willing to follow him? Because he's not willing to give everything up. Okay? He's not willing to lay down his possessions. He's not willing to forget about his wealth. And this is, and, and this specifically then leads Jesus into saying it is easier for the rich person to go through, or for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. Right? That is a very strong statement. Now, some people have um, connected it with this idea of uh, maybe there's this gate in Jerusalem called the eye of the needle, and if a cattle camel got down on its knees and shuffled through, then it could get in, and so that means that the rich person needs to get down low and humble themselves, and then they can get into the kingdom of heaven. That tradition comes a thousand years after Jesus. Uh, in Jerusalem at the time of Jesus, there is no gate called the eye of the needle. Um, nobody's getting their camels down on their knees to shuffle through anything in Jerusalem. So um, this is so what Jesus is saying is meant to be literal. Okay, Some other people think that the word camel could be uh, miss um, a miswriting of the Aramaic word, which sound is is the word camel, which sounds like the word rope, and saying, well, it's just as hard to put a rope through a needle as it would be to get a rich person to the kingdom of heaven. Um, and again, I think it diminishes the hyperbole that Jesus is getting at. So people will use all sorts of ways to explain away 
getting rich people into heaven. Huh. Mostly because they're rich. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what we want to be careful of. Right? We don't want to explain away the difficulty of Jesus' words through all sorts of various cultural interpretations on it. Um, oftentimes the hardest reading of the text is the earliest reading of the text. And Jesus here says it is very difficult for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. And I think it's because of a realization of um, reliance upon God. Uh, that the rich person does not have the same reliance or feeling of reliance upon God. And and I think in our own lives we can examine moments where we have maybe had provision, where we just don't feel the same need to cry out to God for provision and for help and for our needs. Um, and in poverty we recognize the need for God so much more. Uh, and that's kind of what we got in Matthew chapter 6, where Jesus says, you know, I'll provide everything unto you. Seek first my kingdom. And so the disciples, because of their ancient perspective, are thinking about the rich person must be righteous because God has blessed the rich person. And so if the rich person can't be saved and they're the most righteous person, then who can be saved? And Jesus is essentially, he's disconnecting the idea of righteousness with provision. That having money doesn't mean you're more righteous. And that was their perspective in the first century world, of course, because of Deuteronomy, right? If you obey God, you will be blessed. And if you disobey God, you'll be cursed. So if you're rich, then you must be blessed by God, i.e. you must be righteous. So if they can't be saved, who can be saved, right? What, where is the righteous person who can be saved? And so Jesus is, again, he's pointing to this idea that we must humble ourselves, um, I think, be in this position. And <clears throat> I think that there is... There's something to be said for the church's response throughout the centuries of advocating for impro impoverished lifestyles for the purpose of reliance upon God. Mm -hmm. uh, part of joining monastic orders in the medieval ages was to relinquish all possessions. Mm -hmm. That becoming a monk meant giving up everything you owned and joining the monastery. Mm -hmm. wow. And that, uh, I mean, is similar to what we do anyways. <laughs> Why members are some of the most generous people there are. Uh, we just give and give and give and give and give. And then when we come to DTS, we often give away all of our money and, <laughs> and uh, come back on staff and we're like, where's my money at? You know, like, what am I going to do now? Uh, but, um, but that kind of response, I think, is, is really significant for us, is having that response of, of uh, willingness to be impoverished and trust mm -hmm. the Lord in it. It is so countercultural to live in a way that does not exalt or value money as the highest pursuit or the highest place of security. That's so countercultural. Um, now, we can get into wide conversations about stocks and investments and property and all this kind of things and go in all sorts of different directions with this. But I think the essence of the conversation is the same, is that we cannot let anything get in our way of reliance upon God as the primary source of everything. All right. It's time to take a break. So let's take 10 minutes. We'll start at 10.50. Do by commands from the king so that, you know, like there was no people who were not of his bloodline in the kingdom or whatever. Um, but then something I thought about was like, okay, the extreme statement of the eunuch is also the extreme statement of don't get divorced because they feel like they're proper grounds for it. And so, if you can go the extreme of castrating yourself in order to serve a kingdom, you can go the extreme of giving your life to one person. That's a great interpretation. I think that's my interpretation. Yeah. yeah. I think it's a very good interpretation, actually. Okay. Great. Are there any questions or anything from previous hour? I have a question kind of from the previous hour, but also mm -hmm. came up as I was color coding. Like, mm -hmm. I guess, like when it comes to the disciples understanding like Jesus' deity, like is there a certain point where that happens or is it mm -hmm. after the cross? Because I also noticed like in chapter 14, like 33, at some point, like, uh, sorry, to go to it. Um, mm -hmm. <coughs> Like, when they say, yeah, it says, like, um, yeah, after, like, the time with the wind, like, when Jesus is walking on the water, and then they say, oh, truly, you are the son of God. And
and then like later with the transfiguration or like with Peter, like do they understand when they say son of God, like saying son of God as in the deity of Jesus, or is it more just like, oh wow, yeah, you're legit, <laughs> or like yeah, yeah. Um, the one thing that we want to be careful of is is like what we would consider anachronistic reading, and that is anachronistic literally means reading out of chronological order or imposing it out of chronological interpretation on something. So um, <clears throat> what that means is that we take something of the way we read it and then we impose it back upon their understanding and say this must have been how they understood it. That's an mm -hmm. anachronistic reading of the text. Mm -hmm. So um, <clears throat> these disciples are like Jew to the bone, which means they are strict monotheists. There is no other expression of God than Yahweh. That is it. So, whatever if they refer, whenever they refer to Jesus as the Son of God, it can't mean the second person of the Trinity, because the Trinity is not a, a word that comes up in the New Testament, as you guys know now. It's not. While it is begun to be defined, and when Jesus talks about the Holy Spirit and he's talking about the Father, and so you do see there's this dynamic between the two, and then Paul begins to develop it even more. And so you definitely see the presence of the Trinity in the New Testament and in the rest of the Bible. And we can't land on the point that they are all the same. That is a Christian heresy. Okay? We can't land on the fact that Jesus is the same as the Father. Again, heresy. Uh, so we want to be careful where, where we're going with things. So we don't want to say there's not a Trinity. But we also don't want to say that they thought there was a Trinity. Because they are strict monotheists. There's one God and that is him alone. And so after Jesus' resurrection, after the coming of the Spirit, and probably in those 40 days that Jesus is talking with them is where these things start to click. Mm -hmm. And so I think um, whatever they mean here, they can't mean second person of the Trinity. Does that make sense? So yeah. then, in light of the historical background and the original context, then you think about, okay, Son of God as a representative on earth of the one in heaven. So... When Caesar Augustus calls himself the son of God because Julius Caesar has been deified, he is not calling himself a god. He's calling himself a representative of the one in heaven. So Jesus, being the son of God, is, in this sense, does not mean he is deity, the statement. It probably means he is a direct representative of Yahweh in heaven. So he is his kind of commissioned representative in that way because they see him doing the same things as Yahweh has done. They don't equate him with Yahweh because they're monotheists, but they look at him rather as the commissioned representative, like Moses was. So then, would they consider Moses a son of God? I don't. I don't think. I mean, I don't want to go back on that and read yeah. that back into the Old Testament. Okay. Right. But <coughs> it would be like a representative, a direct commissioned representative. Okay. Because you're going to have the same thing said in chapter 16, where he says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Yeah. And that's the same kind of thing. Um, did they think that Christ was deity? No. I mean, we all know that. So when he's equating Christ with son of the living God, then you know that he doesn't think son of the living God means deity. Mm -hmm. Because he didn't think Christ meant deity. Does that help? Yeah. Okay. That helps. Yeah. So it's helpful, like, like that kind of uh, what I mentioned, I think, yesterday, the apophatic theology, where you describe what something is not to find out what it is. It's like, it's helpful to describe, well, they would not have thought this way, so we can just completely discount anything that moves in that direction to kind of help build borderlines of what it could be. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? It doesn't have to be on what we've talked about. It can be from anything you've seen or noticed or thought about. <coughs> Just like, um, yeah, sure. A question. So the, the, <coughs> this chapter twenty. Oh, we're gonna we're gonna come to that. So we we, I'll wait. I'll wait for it. Okay. Yeah. We'll, yeah. We'll start, we're, we're, gonna start 20, we're gonna start chapter twenty right now. Uh, and I, because so many of these things come up, I might hit on touch on some of the things briefly. But again, I'm gonna probably skip over some oh, stuff. I have so questions. Yep. Um, just about John, like. Why the Baptist or John the Baptist? Baptist yeah. yeah, sorry. Um, why would he like? Why does he wear such strange clothing? 
<laughs> is that normal yeah. for a private to do that? Like, does it have any yeah anything, any background to that? Or is it yeah, I want to see where Camel's here. Um, is it? I think it's in, in reference to Elijah. Okay. Um, and kind of following that same vein of ministry um, as wearing Camel's hair. Um, <coughs> let me. Have not asked the same question. They may have thought of the same question, mm. or might have wondered the same thing. Second Kings one eight. mentions that Elijah wore a garment of hair and a belt of leather. Hopefully it is not a garment of human hair. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, oh no. <laughs> what kind of prophet was he? <laughs> yeah, it's the same word used for all hair. But, uh, it's also used word, the word used for hairy, like how Esau was hairy, but also how Zechariah says he will put on a hairy cloak in order to deceive people as a prophet in Zechariah 13, talking about the false prophets that would come. So, yes, uh, 2 Kings 1.8 is the cross-reference to Elijah wearing a garment of hair and a leather belt, the same way that John the Baptist is said here to wear a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt. So I think his direct clothing is meant to emulate Elijah. And the lodestone honey is that? What's that? People go all over the place on it. Was it real locust and honey? Is it just a term for kind of him eating pretty much anything that he has available, that kind of thing? Um, the, the thing to note about it is that um, both locusts and honey are not unclean things, although they are available in the wild, is that they are not something that makes someone unclean. So they are permissible um, wild products. Mm -hmm. huh? I just said, he must be a wild man. <laughs> nice. <laughs> <laughs> Time. He, he's on his way to Jerusalem. Okay, so that's the, the significant thing in this chapter. He's on his way to Jerusalem. He's near to Jericho, um, or passing through Jericho, and that's when James and John's mom come and say, can we uh, sit at, uh, have my son sit at your right and left hand? And I think, I mean, James and John must have sat down with their mom and been like, yo, get this, this guy's the Christ. You know, like, <laughs> she knows, and they're on their way to Jerusalem, and you're going to ride into Jerusalem and set up your throne. Well, I'd like my boys to sit at your right and left hand once you get into your th uh, throne room in Jerusalem. And, of course, Jesus flips it on its head and turns it into a conversation of what is true honor. What really is uh, honor in the kingdom of God? And this, again, goes back to that status, honor, shame conversation amongst the original readers of what really brings honor to a community. And how the actions of Jesus are not something culturally that would bring honor to a community, rather are something that would bring shame to a community. Um, him making all these claims about who he was, and then dying a traitorous death on a cross, would have not brought honor to a community by any means, which is why Paul says, the gospel of Jesus is foolishness to the Greeks. Yeah. Right? That is a, it's a shameful message. Uh, and so Jesus flips it on its head and talks rather about serving and greatness and honor in the kingdom of God. We see that coming up at the end of chapter 19 where he says, but many who are first will be last and the last first. And now we have again this conversation and coming to the end, Jesus says, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant and whoever must, would be first among you must be your slave. Even as the son of man uh, cannot uh, came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So, this whole conversation Jesus has been having here at the end of chapter 19, uh, in chapter 18, has been this picture of what is true status in the kingdom of God. What is honor in God's kingdom? Yeah. 
<coughs> and Jesus setting that example. Now, the last 10 miles or so um, up to Jerusalem uh, from Jericho, uh, Jesus runs into these two blind men. Uh, and these two blind men cry out, of course, have mercy on us, son of David. Was there one blind man named Bartimaeus, or was there two? And this is another instance where Matthew doubles up. Okay, just like the demoniacs uh, amongst the graves, he doubled up. Right Here we get another double up. So uh, was there two men? Was there one man? I don't think it matters. Uh, the point is still the same, and that is that uh, the blind are seeing who Jesus is, and everybody who claims to see has no idea who he is. I have a question. Yes. So you mentioned how would the apocalyptic literature, the numbers matter, and then you uh-huh. mentioned with like the sevens in here somewhere towards the beginning, the 14 generations. Yeah, the generations. That mm-hmm. making a connection with numbers. Mm-hmm. So like, but obviously this is narrative. Yes, not apocalyptic literature. So there shouldn't always be connections to numbers. Yes. But do you think <clears throat> maybe with the two, maybe, maybe? Yeah, so that you, you can draw that. So with the genealogies at the beginning, <coughs> the seven is not symbolic. Yeah. Right? The seven is literal. Yeah. Matthew is literally laying out here seven and seven, seven and seven, seven and seven. Yeah. And then he says, now Jesus is the first of the seven. Yeah. And it's the, and that's the usage of the number in the literal literary context is what gives the meaning in the symbolic literary context. Yeah. So we don't want to, like, impose that upon that so um yeah i wasn't i wasn't trying to say it was symbolic necessarily but i do think that there is something to the fact of two you know two people as a witness right um is matthew just being symbolic and adding a second person in so there's an extra witness i don't think that's why he's doing it but i do think the uh, evidence of two present people does give some weight to that thought that there could be a look towards witnesses of who jesus is I think that's fair. Okay, so Jesus heads towards Jerusalem. This is the route he's going to take from the Mount of Olives, um, coming up from Jericho. He's going to head from Bethany, which is where we know that he's at um, after Lazarus is resurrected at the in uh, John chapter 12, and he's going to walk here. Now, this doesn't take very long from Bethany here, um, where he (laughs) stayed the night and then is riding in on the donkey. The crowds gather in about 30 minutes. And then Jesus goes down the Mount of Olives and rides straight into the temple. And that's where you're going to have the flipping of the tables. Excuse me, in chapter 21, which is the pretty standard um, response of a king coming into the temple. Um, Not to flip tables, but to reform religious systems. Now, as Jesus is coming in, of course, we get this humble picture, the Zechariah fulfillment, (coughs) which Matthew gives to us very clearly. And we want to think of people taking off their cloaks and laying them down before Jesus uh, is just like in 2 Kings 9.13 where cloaks are laid before the king as he comes to Jerusalem or the palm branches that uh, are symbolic of or reflect Judas Maccabeus when he rode into Jerusalem in triumph that they laid palm branches down in front of him and all the people are shouting save us, Hosanna the word Hosanna uh, meaning Um, save us is this cry out for salvation and they're probably not saying save us from our sins right they're saying save us from the romans deliver us from the romans and and what does jesus do well as a kingly figure the first thing he does is he rides to the temple starts flipping tables and starts uh bringing religious uh, uh reformation to the temple in jerusalem because they were desecrating the temple now um, did, I don't, did we talk about this last week? I've had so many conversations where about um, the the problem is not the selling of animals; it's the exchange of money that Jesus has a problem with. Yeah, yeah I mean, we've t- I think we've talked about that before. Also, is that the the animals are great? It's a really good idea. Jesus has no problem with the animals, right? It's the extortion of money and the corruption of the economic system that Jesus is upset at. I mean. There is the, the idea of, well, is the, the bleating of goats uh, and lambs disturbing the environment? And that is a question there. Um, could they have done it outside? Sure. But I think it's more about the fact that people are being ripped off in the temple of God and extorted as they travel 
uh, hundreds of miles to come worship in Jerusalem. And what Jesus says of the temple is the same thing I, that Jeremiah said. And now you guys know that very well. Jeremiah chapter 7. This, um, you have made my father's house a den of robbers instead of a place of prayer for all of the nations. Isaiah says the same thing. And that confrontation would take them right back to 600 years ago where Jeremiah and Isaiah speaking in the temple, calling out the temple and its religious system and saying, you are the exact same people. What are the feelings that brings into people's mind as Jesus comes into the temple and says the same words as Jeremiah and Isaiah? And we are not those people. Right? We do not have idolatry in this temple precinct like they did. Right? You can't say those things about us. Right? I think that those are probably the things on their mind. Um, but Jesus is comparing the exact same situation that they have. <clears throat> the fig tree... Uh, where Jesus curses the fig tree and it dies uh, can be kind of a confusing thing. This kind of goes again to the animals thing from yesterday, where people uh, have a big, I think it's a big deal, Jesus curses a fig tree and it dies. It's like, it's just a tree. Okay? Uh, it's, it's not a big deal. So, <laughs> who cares? You know? Uh, why, why, is it, why does Jesus curse the fig tree? Because there's no fruit on the fig tree. Um, and this is spring. Okay, this is Passover. And so there should at least be some evidence that this fig tree is going to bear figs in the coming months. That while the harvest is not yet, Jesus is not expecting, I think, to find fruit that he can eat on the tree. But he is recognizing there are, is not going to be any fruit on this tree. And that's symbolic of exactly who Israel was. Wow, in Isaiah and he, Hosea and Joel, uh, Israel is referred to as a fig tree. And Jesus is going to then kind of compare Israel to this big tree in chapter 23. And um, you already had John talking about the axe laid at the root of the tree or the vine. And this is that same picture. The fig tree is cursed, which reflects what had happened to Judah 600 years earlier when they were deported to Babylon. And this is exactly in line with the words that he just spoke about the temple being a den of robbers. So all of this is coming together. <clears throat> the last one, I, the last thing I want to highlight in this chapter, um, is this parable of two sons. Now, this is not the parable of the two sons, which we commonly call the prodigal son. This is a different parable, and I think I want to uh, I want to look at this parable simply because I, I think it's a a good lesson for us to learn. So what do you think? A man had two sons. And he went to the first and said, Son, go work in the vineyard today. And he answered, I don't think so. <laughs> but afterwards, he changed his mind and he went to the vineyard and he worked. And he went to the other son and said the same. And he answered, Yeah, sure, I'll, I'll see you in the vineyard. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said, well, the first one. And Jesus said to them, truly I say to you, the IRS and all of the strippers are going to get into the kingdom of God before you. <laughs> I don't think that's too far-fetched of a translation. Yeah. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the IRS and the strippers believed him. And even when you saw it, you did not afterwards change your mind and believe him. Okay. This is, is, a, is a, I think, a very important story for us to have a humble heart. Now, <clears throat> Jesus is confronting the religious leaders on their response to John and inevitably their response to Jesus. Okay. And the question for us is, which son should we be? And I hope the answer that you give is neither. We should not be either one of these sons. We should be the son who says yes and then goes. Mm. Not the son who says no and goes, or says yes and doesn't go. So we have to be too we have to be careful not to jump to too quick of conclusions that we should be like the people in the stories Jesus tells. <laughs> you know? 
we don't always want to emulate the examples Jesus tells us. And so just as a, as a kind of test case for us here, you should read the story and think, man, I don't want to be either of those guys. I want to be the son who says, here's God say go, and I say yes, and then it happens. Okay. And I think that, that is a, a key takeaway from this story. All right, Mateus, your question from chapter 20. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. Um, Jesus, on uh, verse 23, it says, uh, Jesus says to them that he will drink the, his cup. Does that mean, is he like kind of prophesying their death because of so. the gospel? Yes, okay. I think so. Uh, because the cup is connected then with suffering that Jesus has uh, and experiences. And uh, that cup is connected in many places across the New Testament and Old Testament with suffering or kind of the judgment of God or something along those lines. And so I think that it is connected with their future death. Okay. Yeah. Sweet. Thank you. And it's, it's quite cryptic, you know? If you said, yeah, you're going to drink my cup, you're like, well, what do you mean, Jesus? <laughs> um, but I think that they might have an understanding simply because of their Jewish heritage. In the same way that when Jesus says to Peter at the end of the Gospel of John, like, there's going to come a day where people are going to take your clothes, put on clothes that you don't want, and to lead you to a place that you don't want to go. And Peter's like, well, what's going to happen to that guy? You know, Peter understands that's about his death. Even though it's so cryptic to us, we'd be like, Am I going to get a new wardrobe <laughs> town? Like, what's happening here? And Peter knows, okay, he's talking about me dying. And so I think that they would have picked up on that. Yeah. So wouldn't the cupbearer sit on one of the sides? Like the literal cupbearer? He would have stood, probably, at the at the side of the king. He, I don't think he uh, sits okay. at the side. Yeah, because the uh, sitting is a sign of authority in a throne room. Okay, here uh, is a picture of Jerusalem. This is quite blurry up here where I'm at, but I think it should be a little bit uh, better back there. <clears throat> and this is obviously where all of this is happening here. Um, you have Herod's fortress where Jesus is going to stand before Herod. That happens in the Gospel of Luke, but not in the Gospel of Matthew. And uh, then this is uh, commonly where also he's going to stand before Pilate. It, it seems like he's kind of trounced all over Jerusalem. Um, but Pilate potentially was closer to the temple um, geographically and Jerusalem-wise. So uh, the trial of Jesus is going to take place quite hush-hush. Quite but I wanted to just put a picture there just to get a glimpse or to think about what Jerusalem is like. So Jesus tells a lot of parables in, in here in his confrontation in the temple precinct. And we get to chapter 22, and he tells this parable of the wedding feast. And the parable of the wedding feast is one I had referenced in connection with Revelation chapter 19 and the wedding garments that people were wearing. So you can connect those two a little bit here because you see very clearly anybody who is not dressed in the right clothes is not coming to this wedding feast. But in this wedding feast, <clears throat> the, the Jews would not miss the connection. They're, they're not, this is not going to go over their heads. Just like the parable of the tenants, they hear this parable and they're like, Oh dang, he's talking about us. You know, like they know who he's talking about. And so, this uh, this statement about uh, their rejection of the king, them um, not even taking the second invitation, which would have been completely far fetched in their culture, and then the king sending armies and burning their city, probably is in connection with 70 A.D. And that could give you a direct kind of allusion to the fact that if it had already happened. Um, if you want to take it that way, or it could just be Jesus prophesying. But this should be taken in light of Matthew chapter 7, those who would come to Jesus at the end of the age and say, Lord, Lord, did we do all these things? He says, I never knew you. Right? Is that kind of like you're not wearing the right clothes for this feast? And it removes them from outer dark or removes them into outer darkness. And then also into chapter 25 with the sheep and the goats, where they are separated from one another. And <clears throat> this uh, again, I think fits with what I had mentioned before, you know. Um, the gospel of this age is that God wants us just as we are. We don't have to change. Right? That anybody should be welcomed into the wedding feast. And that is often used to justify particular styles of behavior more than anything else. Right? How we act, how we live, what we think. But of course when the blind and the lame come to Jesus, he changed them. And when sinners came, he didn't leave them as they were. 
And so while Je Jesus' love meets us where, we at, where we're at, it never allows us to stay there. And if we refuse to put on the wedding clothes of the kingdom, love, mercy, truth, holiness, then we can also expect to be removed when the time comes. So there is a call to clothe ourselves, just like Paul says, take off the old self and clothe yourself with the new self in Christ Jesus, in Ephesians chapter 4. So <clears throat> that is, a, I think, a direct confrontation, uh, both denying God's invitation, but also the call then to make sure that you are clothed correctly coming to this wedding feast. Now the taxes um, that Jesus is confronted about uh, is in each of the synoptics a great great scenario, right, that highlights how we have got to devote ourselves to God, right? In a moment where Jesus is trapped, and he has no way out. The Herodians are there. If Jesus says, don't pay taxes, they're going to arrest him and bring him to Herod. The Pharisees are there. If Jesus says, pay taxes, they're going to say that he is siding with the Romans, and he is not, cannot be the Messiah. So what does Jesus do? Right? He fools everybody. Um, and he kind of gets in their faces by telling them to get a coin, right? Whose coin are they supposed to get? One with Caesar's image on it. Well, they have to go and find one because the temple precinct does not allow Roman money inside of the temple precinct. So he's already kind of like shaming them a little bit by telling them to go and get a, a coin that they would have considered to be an idol and bring it into the temple precinct because it has Caesar's face on it. Mm. And then he says, well, whose face is this? <laughs> like, well, that's Caesar's. And you're supposed to give unto him what is his. And then back to God what is God's, right? As every person bears the image of God, so also is each person to devote themselves to God fully. The Sadducees ask this question about the resurrection, which, again, one that is in each of the Gospels. And Jesus is, um, I'll, I'll hit on this specifically because of the fact that it is one of those, par or one of those stories that kind of can be confusing even after you've studied it a lot. But the way Jesus confronts the Sadducees is by using the Pentateuch, which is the only portion of Scripture they took as authoritative. They read the rest of the Old Testament, but they only took Genesis through Deuteronomy as authoritative on doctrine concerning God. So, and it's because it came from Moses. So, what does Jesus do? Not only does he confront them using their Scripture, right? he says to them, that uh, in the burning bush does God not say, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? And through that, through that present tense verb, I am, the implication is that God is still their God, and thus they are with him in heaven and will face a future resurrection. If God had said, I was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, then there would be reason to doubt a future resurrection. Jesus will also appeal to the authority of God over the authority of Moses. Mm -hmm. Where the Sadducees would appeal to the authority of Moses, Jesus says God himself has said this. And that trounces anything that they would claim. Because they have opened up this statement by saying, teacher, Moses said, blah, blah, blah. Jesus is going to say, um, you, uh, and as for the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was said to you by God? <laughs> and so, yes. so he is directly kind of hit him upside the head and say, you guys need to read the Bible, uh, get it together. So that, uh, that's why this is so astonishing for the crowds at the end. You know, as it says, when the crowds heard it, they were astonished at his teaching. And of course, the, um, the quote of uh, I, uh, uh, Psalm 110, verse 1, at the end here, where Jesus confounds everybody. So they ask him all these questions, and he he shames all of them by answering their questions that they thought were so tough. And so he gets honor begrudgingly from all of the leaders because he's answered their questions. And then he shames them by answering their questions, but also by asking them a question that they can't answer. Mm -hmm. How can David be the Lord of the Christ if David says, my Lord said to my Lord, sit in my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool? How can David be greater than the Christ because the Christ is David's son and yet David calls him Lord. It's confusing for us anyways, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, Jesus! <laughs> and it's, it's because of the wording of the Hebrew phrase. In Psalm 110 it says that 
uh, it literally will read, Yahweh said to my Adonai. Okay, so God said to my Lord, and sit at my right hand. Um, and so there are two different lords being used here in the Old Testament, Yahweh and Adonai. And it is the comparison of the similar authority, like the Son of Man receiving the authority in Daniel chapter 7, which will be an important passage for the remainder of this book in a few places. So chapter 23, <clears throat> Jesus is going to confront the Pharisees, a, a passage that again is uh, directly unique to Matthew. And this starts the last discourse of Jesus. So he is going to confront the Pharisees. He's going to talk about the destruction of the temple. And then he's going to talk about the, um, the end of the age in chapter 25. <clears throat> now, the, uh, the place where he opens up here and telling the disciples <laughs> about the Pharisees, the scribes and the Pharisees sit in verse 2. The scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. So do and observe whatever they tell you, but do not do, uh, but not the word works they do. And I don't know about you guys, but I had heard that a lot growing up. Um, do as I say, not as I do, <laughs> which is an absolutely terrible way to teach anybody to live, right? But that's what Jesus says about the Pharisees. They've got great things to say, but their lives are terrible. So do what they say, but do not do what they do. Uh, and that is a call for any one of us to align ourselves with what we say. We're not all perfect by any means, and we will not arrive at the place of having everything figured out this side of eternity. So that doesn't, it shouldn't stop us from speaking the truth, right? But we must assess ourselves, right? And make sure that we are speaking consistent words with the way that we are at least trying to live. Where so many people today you might have a pastor in the pulpit who then gets caught in sin because he is telling people to live one way and living a different way. Uh, in here, uh, Jesus will confront their outward righteousness, which we um, had seen before. Uh, they are, sorry, not yet. That'll be, that'll come in uh, fifth and sixth woe here that we talked about before. But here, Though they do all sorts of things to model their own righteousness for people, but this goes back to Matthew chapter 5 and 6, where Jesus says, do your work so that other people can see you, but not for the praise of other people. And Jesus confronts the Pharisees for doing the opposite of that. They're doing their works so that other people can praise them. And they're going to get the reward in this life, just like Jesus talked about in chapter 6, for those who do their works before men, um, where they have these outward signs, but in actuality they are dead on the inside. Jesus in his confrontation of the Pharisees and the scribes here, will fit into line with all of the prophets before him. Right? The seven woes should sound very familiar, like Jesus is speaking like a prophet. So he fits into that kind of past uh, <clears throat> style of speaking, which will fold into chapter 24, where Jesus gives the Olivet Discourse. And through these woes, we see the first two woes are going to confront keeping people from the kingdom of heaven and instead making them children of hell even more so than themselves third woe uh, is addressing incorrect valuing things that they have elevated wrongly in the kingdom of God the fourth woe is how they have um, made certain matters more weighty and forsaken other important matters and what they have done is they have laid down the significant matters of mercy and justice, and instead they have elevated the priestly laws. And so they're much more concerned with tithing their spices, but not about faithfulness. And the hyperbole of straining the gnat, but drinking the camel, should be read hyperbolically. Right? And the irony of it should be very clear. I mean, could you imagine somebody who has a cup of tea in front of them and picks out a little bug out of it, a mosquito out of it, and then turns around and is trying to swallow a camel. Like, it's ridiculous, right? <laughs> it's just foolishness. Like, one leg at a time, like, put it in my mouth, right? And that is the irony, is that they have put so much weight on the things that seem to be quite insignificant in light of the values of God's heart. And you can think back to Micah, right? His desire for every person to 
value justice, walk humbly with their God. And Jesus is saying, you have forgotten that. That's like trying to drink a camel. And that is, a, I think it's a strong word to these uh, leaders. The fifth and sixth ones concern outward appearances, the same kind of thing that we had, uh, I had mentioned before about the graves, painting all the graves white and um, inside are, they're full of dead bones, even though they have really good intentions on the outside. But Jesus is calling for consistency through and through, that their outward lives should match their inward heart. And the seventh woe is this woe against their wicked hearts where they have claimed to be innocent. And this goes back to the prophets, where they have killed the prophets. And they think that they are different than their fathers, but they are going to do the exact same thing where they will kill the prophet, having him crucified. The closing prophetic statement over Jerusalem in here, this chapter, where Jesus say, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. It sounds just like the prophets of old. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate, for I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. You want to pay attention to verse 38 there. And you can write next to it. Verse 21-13. In 21-13, Jesus says, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. Now Jesus says, See, your house is left to you desolate. So Jesus has gone from referring to this as my house to just your house. And this is essentially what Stephen will do the same thing of in his Acts chapter 7 speech, where he will refer to the temple as having been turned into an idol. They have made the temple into a worshipped um, figure rather than the God who stands behind the temple. And that'll be that final judgment on Jerusalem. Here. <coughs> So chapter 24, the Olivet Discourse, and Jesus will be sitting on the Mount of Olives here, and I think I showed you pictures in Mark of this, Jesus sitting on the, uh, the Mount of Olives, and he can see into the, into the Temple Mount. Mm -hmm. And so he sees everything here, and he can see everything, I mean, the sacrifices are burning, smoke is going up, there's people mulling around, it's Passover, and so it is probably absolutely packed in the Temple Mount yeah. when Jesus is with his disciples on the Mount of Olives, prophesying about the destruction of Jerusalem. The key, as I have mentioned before, is this phrase, this generation, okay, which will come up at the end here, talking about this generation shall not pass away until all of these things have come to pass in chapter 24, verse 34. So we've whatever we read, we have to read in light of that as kind of the interpretive key for the beginning of this chapter. Um, do we take generation to mean 40 years, or do we take generation to mean an extended period of time? Um, and what are our grounds for that? We can't just choose the, our interpretation of generation based off of what we would like it to mean. We want to look at the other usages of generation and see how is Matthew used generation, and how is it used in the rest of the New Testament to determine what is the likeliest interpretation for this passage. Um, I'm going to think it's the destruction of Jerusalem. So Jesus leads them out across the Kidron Valley, tells them no stone is going to be left upon another. And that would be pretty hard to believe when it is the most beautiful structure that they can even imagine. I mean, I don't know, what beautiful structures do we have that are like super renowned worldwide? The one in Barcelona. Sagrada Familia. Yeah. yeah. Sagrada Familia. Tower of Eiffel. Eiffel Tower. Eiffel Tower. Eiffel Tower. Eiffel Tower. Eiffel Tower. Eiffel Tower. What about modern buildings? Are there any modern buildings that are held in incredible renown worldwide? Oh, Dubai. 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 
Pentagon. Yeah. <laughs> Which Almost one? Didn't. Pentagon. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Not for its beauty, but significance in the country in the White House. Yeah, White House for the United States, definitely. I um, mean, it's it's basically that kind of thing, like Jesus coming along and saying, like the parliamentary building of whatever nation, you know, whatever that is, the White House. Um, you say, I don't know, Buckingham Palace or um, whatever building that is. You can think of uh, the European Union in Brussels, you know, that being torn down. And Jesus is looking over and he goes, I tell you what, there's not going to be one panel of window left standing, right? There's not going to be one brick left in the White House. Everything is going to be on the floor. You're like, you serious? Like 70 years from now, it just does not seem possible. You, I mean, could you think of like Jesus saying that to any one of our nations? In 70 years, or sorry, in 40 years, like in one generation, in one generation, there's not going to be anything standing of this building. I mean, this is shocking. All the disciples are like, okay, so how will we know? You can, I mean, you can hear the doubt in them, looking at the most important building to their life in front of them, and Jesus is now saying it's going to be destroyed. Well, okay. <coughs> All right, Jesus, you, everything else you've said has been right, but how will we know? And that's where Jesus then gets into all that is going on, and he begins to talk about all the stuff that's happening and you know, that these wars, rumors of wars, earthquakes, these things going on are just going to be the beginnings of these birth pangs that come upon Jerusalem and upon his people. Um, let's see here. Okay, I, I want to hit, before we get into that real quick, one thing I would do want to hit is in verse 3 where he says, As he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and at the end of the age. Okay, the word coming here is the word parousia, um, and that is this uh, the word that is commonly used when talking about Jesus's um, like return or the coming of his kingdom or something like that. Um, and that's going to be important for later on in how this word is used when we talk about or you um, translate the English word coming in this passage or in this chapter. So they ask, when will your coming be? Well, the word parousia. Um, used in the Greco-Roman context is used when, it's, when Caesar would come and visit a town, right? Caesar perusia to a town. Like he's coming to visit that town, but it's not just used in a physical sense of visiting someplace, but it can also be used when a god or a goddess does something dramatic, like a healing or a judgment or some display of power or their presence. So there's a lot surrounding this word in the Greco-Roman context. And for Jesus, he's saying, the disciples are asking, well, what is going to be the signs of your coming, right? Whether that, that coming is in his um, royal procession or whether it is his some kind of climactic or dramatic supernatural action or something like that. So all of that is uh, kind of housed in this question of when will be the end of the age. Now, the end of the age, we commonly think of that statement as being like the end of all things. But as you go through the prophets, you know that there are kind of segments of time and, and things, there's a close of one age and, a, and the beginning of the next, or, or things like that. It's not just like the end of all human history. So it can just be the conclusion of one era of time, which could be then looking at the destruction of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple as the close to the era of the temple and its functioning ability in, Israel, in uh, Jewish culture. Now, when Jesus says all of these things happening, these are about the beginnings of birth pangs, what he is saying is that you will not be surprised. Okay? Mm -hmm. You will know when it's going to start. And he's giving them clues. Okay. Um, I know Ernest has a good idea of what Jesus means now um, by talking about the beginnings of birth pangs. Uh, when Miji uh, went into labor, or beginning to um, move towards labor, there is quite a distance between feeling those pains coming on um, and feeling the, the moment of, okay, it's coming. Um, and there's all this kind of recognition and these moments that point towards, okay, the baby is going to come. This is going to happen, but there's no telling exactly when it's going to happen. But there's all of these signs that point toward it happening. 
So that's what Jesus is kind of getting at with the disciples here is that um, there's going to be a lot pointing towards it. <clears throat> what we end up finding then, Jesus points towards the abomination of desolation in here. Uh, so when you see the abomination of desolation, uh, the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Okay. This is a significant statement because of the fact that Christians fled the city of Jerusalem before the Civil War started in Jerusalem. Okay. So in the early 60s, the Christians left Jerusalem. And they left Jerusalem because they recognized what was coming. And they recognized what was coming because of the words of Jesus in the Gospels here. What was that sign? What was the abomination of desolation? Well, the Romans um, in uh, I think it's 65 or 66 come into the temple and they seize money from the treasury. And they come in with their golden standards, uh, which have eagles on the top of them. They, they come in with the eagle. Uh, they trounce upon the holy place, just like Daniel had spoken of, this abomination of desolation. When that happens, the, the Christians leave. They flee to the city nearby called Pella, uh, and they survive the Jewish civil war in Jerusalem and the destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans because of the words of Jesus here. <clears throat> the passage with incredible apocalyptic literature shouldn't be too far gone from your mind now after doing Revelation last week, seeing this climactic language of, the, of cosmic powers and things shaking in the heavenly place, and how that then could connect potentially with the political powers and wicked powers. We see could see this from Isaiah chapter 13, uh, verse 10, and Isaiah 34, 4, which both use this same language to talk about judgment on Edom and judgment on Babylon and how their rulers are like these cosmic powers that are being shaken. So it's Isaiah 13, 10, Isaiah 34, 4, connecting with the same kind of cosmic language. So it's I, I wouldn't jump to the conclusion that it's talking about some dramatic and cosmic shaking at the end of the age. But what we want to, uh, one thing we want to pay attention to in this passage is the coming of the Son of Man. Okay, verse 30, it says, Then will appear in the heavens the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with a power and great glory. So it sounds like Jesus is coming back. You know, it sounds like this is the end of the age, Jesus is returning. Where does this passage come from? The Son of Man coming on the clouds. Daniel 7. Okay. In Daniel chapter 7, it talks about the Son of Man coming on the clouds. The word that's used here for coming is not the same word the disciples use in chapter 24, verse 3. This is not the word parousia. This is not associated with Jesus' second coming, with Caesar's royal procession, or some kind of supernatural sign. Okay, that is not what the passage is about. In the passage in Daniel 7, the passage of coming on the clouds has nothing to do with returning from heaven to earth. It is about going to the throne room in heaven. That's what Daniel sees, is the Son of Man going to the Ancient of Days, not coming from the Ancient of Days. So we've got to look at it inside of its context of what's going on there. This is not about some primitive form of space travel where Jesus will ride on the clouds back down to earth. Right? It is a picture of receiving divine authority in the heavenly places. And it is uh, thus Jesus is then pointing towards the destruction of the temple as a divine act of judgment in light of taking that rightful place in the heavenlies in Daniel chapter 7. Oh, here's those references in Daniel. <clears throat> we'll take a break here in just a second. I, I just want to finish out this chapter um, just by saying that there, there's a statement of, you know, not knowing the day or the hour. Um, and it's true, right? We don't want to be guessing about when exactly Jesus is coming back and trying to figure that out and land on uh, when he's returning. But Jesus says you'll notice, like you'll be aware of these things happening when this is all coming to the end. And the last part of this, after uh 
verse 34 and 35, because Jesus says in verse 35, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away, after just saying this is all going to happen in one generation. So that's quite, quite significant for your pre interpretation for the previous portion of this chapter. But verse 36 through the end seems to be pointing towards the final climactic close of this age, right? The fullness of this age. And that then leads you directly into chapter 25. Right, because there seems to be talks of final judgment, there seems to be talks of the setting up of the kingdom, and that leads into chapter 25, where you have three specific par uh, parables about the close of this age and final judgment. So this statement of um, being like the days of Noah, uh, one's going to be taken away and one is going to be left, all of that kind of language, uh, the one taken away and the one left. Most people, I mean, people will interpret that as the rapture. You know, someone's going to be taken away in the air and people are going to be left. But in the language of the first century, when Jesus is talking about this, the person that is taken away is not the blessed person. <laughs> they are the one destined for death and slavery. The person who's left is the one who's safe. Okay, when an army comes in and conquers your city and takes a bunch of people away, that is not a blessed destiny. You can think back to the people in Jerusalem. When Babylon came to Jerusalem and took people away from Babylon, and Jeremiah says, I see two baskets. There's a basket of healthy grapes and really fruitful, plump grapes, and then there's a basket full of ro uh, rotten grapes. And the people in Jerusalem are like, great, we're the plump, full, fruitful basket. And Jeremiah says, no, you're the rotten basket. <laughs> yeah. Their perspective is the same perspective Jesus is hitting on here, where the people who are remaining are the ones who are safe. The people who are taken away are the ones in the, like that perception. So Jeremiah is flipping the, the perception. Jesus is playing off of the actual perception, which is that when you stay, you're safe. When you're taken away, you're not. And so the implication is there is going to come a day where the people you thought were the ones who are right next to you are going to be taken away. This is the sheep and the goats, the wheat and the tares, Matthew chapter 7. Come to me, Lord, Lord. It is the same thing throughout this whole gospel. and It's a heart check to say... Are you in the right place? All right. It's a good time to take a break. Let's take five minutes. Start back at 11.50. So the abomination of desolation can, I mean, essentially for me, this is my interpretation. So like that Jesus is saying, like, this thing from Daniel has been multiple um, fulfillments of right? Because, like, it definitely... This... It sounds so great, right? In the passage, I just, I just want to read the passage. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on his left. Okay. This is just like the wheat and the tares in chapter 13, right, that they're both growing up together. They both seem to be part of the same field. They both look at each other, and they're like, we're the same. You know, we're both part of the same flock. We have the same shepherd. And just like Matthew 7, there's going to be those who come to me and say, Lord, Lord, and Jesus say, I never knew you. And so here, there's someone on his right and someone on his left, and the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world for I was hungry and you gave me food I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink I was a stranger and you welcomed me I was naked and you clothed me I was sick and you visited me I was in prison and you came to me then the righteous will answer him saying Lord when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? I didn't see you on the streets. And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison or visit you? And the king will answer them, truly, I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of my brothers, you did it to me. Then he will look to those on his left. Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. That's enough right there. <laughs> yeah. okay. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. 
I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick, and in prison, you did not visit me. And they will answer, and they'll say, Lord, when did we see you hungry and thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister to you? Then he will answer and say to them, Truly, I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. That is a hard passage. Because it says nothing about where they put their faith, and they both think they're part of the same flock. So, all of these parables are a call for self-examination. A call for preparedness. So that when we stand before Jesus on the last day, we will not be amongst those goats. Because there will be people who think they are sheep, but are actually goats. Scary business. <laughs> yeah. Right. It, the thing is, is it puts a... I don't think it's inherently wrong to have a fear of the Lord that you constantly test yourself to see where, where you are at. Right? It is... Now, there is an assurance that comes with the Holy Spirit. I don't dis, I'm not discounting that whatsoever. I mean, Paul is very clear on that. We can know where we are going. But I think we have we want to continue to be in a place of like standing before the words of Jesus saying, Am I walking in accordance with what he has said? Right? Um, and there isn't a for me, there's not a fear of losing my salvation or anything like that, but there's a constant assessment of myself. Am I living up to this? Am I walking according yeah. to these ways? And not in a condemnation way, right, where I'm I'm not condemning myself according to um, the scriptures, the words of Jesus here, Paul says in Romans 8, 1, there's no more condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, but I definitely think there's a heap load of conviction. And I want to make sure I'm in line with what God has instructed us. Um, so, it puts a little bit of, a little bit of pressure on me, and fire under the, the burner there, keep going, and do, do better, and uh, keep going after Christ, and that's what I want to do. Yeah, um, so, yeah. Mm. Paul puts it this way, that he strives after Jesus. He strains to gain hold of Christ the same way that Christ strained to, strained to gain hold of him. Philippians chapter 3. And man, oh man, I want to do the very same thing. So, chapter 26, the last supper here, um, we see the trial. I'm just going to go through this pretty quickly. Um, the trial of Jesus, it's quite hush-hush. Everything's trying to be kept under wraps, so it's not in front of a huge crowd. Um, the disciples, when Jesus is uh, brings them together to share the Last Supper with one another, uh, is doing so at the Passover meal together, where he is now inaugurating a new covenant, just like Passover had inaugurated the first covenant. Okay, So Jesus is inaugurating a new covenant here through his actions. <clears throat> and we find that when he says to them, talks about his betrayal because he says that he will be betrayed in his other two passion predictions he says or three he says i will be betrayed now here he says truly i say to you one of you will betray me mm -hmm. he hasn't said that before but now he says one of you are going to betray me at the last supper and now that's pretty distressing and probably why they are very sorrowful mm -hmm. in uh verse 22 now, <clears throat> Jesus is going to institute the Lord's Supper, which is um, the second sacred practice, sacred ritual of Christianity. The first is baptism, the second is the Eucharist, or the Lord's Supper. And the Lord's Supper um, is something I would just challenge all of us to take seriously, uh, very audibly. Uh, often in the evangelical Western Church, we can be very flippant with the Lord's Supper. Um, and, you know, you might we might take the Lord's Supper together and put out a loaf of bread and we rip all the pieces up and put it in a bowl and then we joke about eating it afterwards. Right? Um, the Eastern Church uh, has been so particular about the Lord's Supper that they will not use leavened bread for the Lord's Supper because if they um, tear the bread, crumbs might fall on the ground and desecrate the sacred wow. nature of the Eucharist. They don't want to leave the crumbs that represent Jesus' body that's been broken for us on the ground. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's, just a, it's just a call in light of all of church history to 
to think about the Eucharist as a the symbol that it is, but maybe even more than that, the actual action that it is, not just the symbol that it represents, which would, is tends tends to be where we go with it. Um, I have, uh, on a complete side note, have wrestled with or thought about the um, the value behind holding the theology of transubstantiation, um, which is what the Catholics believe about the Eucharist, is that when you take the bread and the wine and you consume them, they become the body and the blood of Jesus Christ in your stomach. And the sacredness of that mystery that is in Christianity, that we can sometimes diminish by our rational nature and remove the mysterious nature of the actions of Christianity that are present. Now, um, I'm not advocating this, what is many often said by Protestants as cannibalism, <laughs> eating the body and blood of Jesus. But the, sim, the uh, representation of that thing, I think that Luther um, provides us a great middle ground where he will say transubstantiation is a bit too far. So he tones it back a little bit to say that the, the cup and the bread always possess the presence of Jesus Christ in them while we take them. And so there is the presence of God with us every time we take communion. And so we must take it with respect. Never to treat it flippantly, and always to treat it as it is, a sacred ritual. <clears throat> as Jesus instituted it. So Jesus um, foretells the denials. Um, we see them going into the garden. This profound moment where Jesus submits to the will of, of the Father. For him to go to the cross, which to me is one of the most confrontational bits of Christianity uh, in the life of Jesus, is the fact that he is in the garden saying, not my will, but yours be done, and how often I'm crying out, my will be done to God. <laughs> Jesus uh, will be brought to the courtyard of Caiaphas, be put on trial, and as he's on trial, we obviously see the denial by Peter, all these questions against Jesus by the Jewish leaders, which you guys have read a number of times. The one that gets Caiaphas, the one where he looks at Jesus and says he's blaspheming, is when Jesus quotes from Daniel 7. And... He, he says, Jesus said to him, You have said so, but I tell you, from now on you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. So when he quotes Daniel 7, that is when Caiaphas flips his lid. Right? Because that is unacceptable. Okay? You have uttered blasphemy to think that you will be next to Yahweh in heaven. So we see the significance of this passage and the weight that it carries for people at this time. And so to talk about this passage of coming on the clouds is not, again, it's not a return, but it is the ascension. It is the rising to and being placed at the right hand of the power or the ancient of days in Daniel 7. This also connects, of course, with Psalm 110, um, being given a throne and a footstool um, and seated on that throne until the enemies are completely made the footstool. In chapter 27, uh, Jesus is brought before Pontius Pilate. <clears throat> Pontius Pilate uh, was held by all of the Jews as a corrupt leader, someone who did not do what the Jews wanted them to do and would do the things the Jews did not want him to do. He was a thief, dishonest and violent, and often executed untried prisoners during his procuratorship in Judea. So Jesus will be brought over to Pilate. In the meantime, we have an interjected story of Judas hanging himself. So what is going on with Judas hanging himself, and what is Matthew quoting here? Because, as you guys may be familiar with this quarter, when you read this passage, it can be a little bit confusing, especially because he starts by saying, then was Judas hangs himself, they take the money, they buy a field, and then it says, And then was fulfilled what had been spoken by the prophet Jeremiah, saying, And they took thirty pieces of silver, the price of him on whom a price had been set by some of the sons of Israel, and they gave them over for the potter's field, as the Lord directed me. Where does that quote come from? Jeremiah? One of the, one of the it's in one of the prophets. Prophet. I don't remember which one. 
Matthew says it's Jeremiah, but this quote comes from somewhere else. Zechariah. Zechariah. It is a direct quote from Zechariah. So what's going on with Matthew here, right? Um, <coughs> is Matthew quoting Jeremiah or is he quoting Zechariah? Okay, well, he's, he is directly quoting Zechariah. But if you guys recall, when Jeremiah has been locked up in prison, someone comes to offer him a field. And he buys a field and he takes that, that uh, scroll and he puts it in a jar and he saves that. And, and it is a prophetic act of fields will be bought here again. So I think what Matthew is probably doing and what many people think is that he's blending prophecies. So he's taking the Zechariah prophecy of what happened here, but he's also looking at the field prophecy from Jeremiah. And he's looking about what will happen and, and that this field was purchased. And so I think there's a blending of prophecies here. And the reason he quotes it as coming from Jeremiah, even though the, the words come from Zechariah, is because he's wanting you to think about the story of Jeremiah with the field in light of this scenario that happened with Judas and the Zechariah quote. So not everybody likes that interpretation, but that's mine. When Jesus comes to stand before Pilate, this is, a again, a small group of people. But Jesus is silent before Pilate. Um, as he is silent before Pilate, this is an amazing response, uh, as seen by how Pilate is amazed at him, and that he does not want to crucify Jesus. In fact, just like all the other Gospels affirm, Jesus is seen as innocent by Pilate. But um, Pilate wants to hand him over, or um, release him, and so he will propose to follow in line with his pretty standard practice. Now, the releasing of prisoners, um, as I recently read, was a infrequent but not impossible practice of Roman governors at various times to appease the crowds or to, as a sign of goodwill from the Romans, a prisoner might be released who was valuable to the people. Usually not somebody who had instigated crimes against the Romans like it is with Barabbas, but um, criminals who might have been taken because of what they were saying or something like that. And so it's not, a, not impossible, but it's not frequent. With Barabbas here, we see that he is obviously guilty and Jesus is obviously innocent. And Pilate proposes then to free Jesus, and instead they're going to cry out about Barabbas. <clears throat> so whom would you have me release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? Now, it's interesting that Jesus is uh, qualified by the saying, who is called Christ, right? Because we saw that at the beginning that Matthew uses that as a title for Jesus in the first chapter. He doesn't just say Jesus Christ as a name, but Jesus Christ as a title. So calling Jesus, who is the Christ here, and linking him with Barabbas provokes the question of, well, who is Barabbas? Okay. The Barabbas may not be his first name. Uh, Barabbas, the literal name of Barabbas, the literal translation of the name Barabbas means son of the father. Okay. Bar, bar Abbas. Okay. Abba being father, bar, son of. Just like it says of Simon in chapter 16, Simon bar Jonah. So Simon bar Abbas. And in, the, uh, in certain Greek manuscripts, it actually gives Barabbas a first name. And that is Jesus. Um, and in certain Greek manuscripts of Matthew, it calls him, it puts in the mouth of Pilate, would you rather have me release to you Jesus Barabbas or Jesus who is called the Christ? Not too far-fetched considering the fact that Joshua is a common name and its translation into Greek of Jesus would not be too far off. So um, there, there could be that parallel there. We find that other people named Jesus in the early church. You see that in the book of Acts, a guy named who is Jesus, who is also called Justice. Um, so it is not an impossible thought. Um, and I think that it builds a deeper parallel between the two of them. Because what you have here is Jesus, the true Son of the Father, who will take the place of Jesus, the guilty Son of the Father. Right? And Jesus stands in the place of Barabbas um, as they demand to have the guilty Jesus released to them so that the innocent Jesus might be crucified. I do think 
the authors just leave his name Barabbas, probably for lack of, uh, to remove any confusion. Because you could think then, well, was Jesus the Christ actually released and that he didn't actually get crucified and didn't raise from the dead and Christianity is just a farce because of that. So there's a lot of things that could play off of that. So I, I think that it's probably not included in the other Gospels for the reason to re, uh, obliterate any confusion that might come up. But Jesus Christ is handed over to be crucified, flogged, in, Mar in Mark's Gospel, we talked about the severity of crucifixion and everything that comes along with it, so I don't want to deal, detail that again here. But Jesus is brought out, crucified at Golgotha, the place of the skull. And when Jesus is on the cross, just a couple feet above the ground, and people walking by, mocking him, gawking at him, he's offered... Uh, gall mixed with wine, which is an anesthetic. Okay. It is an offering to reduce the pain of the cross. And Jesus refuses it. He refuses to numb the pain of the suffering that he has chosen to endure and is the will of God for him. Uh, crucifixion is a terrible, terrible death. And usually last, people lasted on the cross 48 to 72 hours. So Jesus' death in six hours is surprising. And in John's Gospel, is is seen very clearly with how shocked Pilate is that Jesus is already dead. Joseph of Arimathea comes and asks for the body, and Pilate's like, he's already dead? He sends a centurion just to double check. Because Jesus died so quickly. And the, the act of crucifixion was understood to be such a heinous execution that no Roman citizen could be executed except by direct edict of Caesar. Herod Agrippa, uh, sorry, Herod the Great had refused to crucify anybody under his leadership. That while he was king over Judea, he outlawed Roman crucifixion because of how heinous it was. And then I mentioned, I think yesterday, that when the Romans came in and conquered Jerusalem, they crucified so many Jews that they ran out of trees, the Josephus tells us. This is um, not something unfamiliar to people, but it doesn't make it any less brutal. This is the ultimate sign of Jesus turning the other cheek. That when his enemies have beaten him, have, that he has uh, been treated so poorly, rejected, defamed, that he continues to carry the cross. He gives up his cloak and carries the burden that the soldiers should have carried. He loves his enemies. And now he is seen as a light set on a hill. And as it com comes to the point where Jesus cries out on the cross, um, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Um, we should have in our mind Psalm 22, verse 1. Okay. And it is behoo of us to read that passage in light of the crucifixion and see how directly that passage parallels the crucifixion. But Christians have commonly read chapter 22, 23, and 24 together. That psalm, these psalms have flowed together. Psalm 22, about the crucifixion of Jesus. That ultimately, at the end of the psalm, he is entrusting himself into the hands of God. And that he is not viewing God as having forsaken him and left him in this moment necessarily, but is viewing God ultimately in light of this lament, um, lament situation to then trust in God at the end. Then chapter 23 gives us the good shepherd, right? Mm -hmm. Um, being led through the valley of the shadow of death, your rod and staff comfort me, being, um, having a table laid out for me in the presence of my enemies. That's Psalm 23. And then 24 cries out to open up the gates of heaven that the king of glory might come in. And those psalms flowing together, looking towards the resurrection of Jesus Christ and his exaltation to come to his rightful place as he comes on the clouds of heaven to sit next to the ancients of days. And I don't think it's too far-fetched to think that Jesus probably had that in mind as well. 
that he is thinking about, Psalm 22, 23, and 24, that this action is not just a death on a cross, but is unto something much greater. Did you say that was the Christians or the Jews who took the read these together? Christians. Yeah, Christians have commonly read them together. Because Jews will take Psalm 22 to be a psalm of David, that it is about David. It is at Jesus' death that the sign above the cross is affirmed on the mouth of the centurion, where he will say, truly, this was the Son of God. He is the King of the Jews. That is the affirmation of his identity here, and it takes a Gentile to recognize what Israel had missed. At that same moment, the veil is torn in the temple, and this... uh, unusual circumstance with the earthquake that happens and the tearing of the veil uh, opens a way for the priests to come into the presence of God. Okay? The torn veil does not open a way for everybody to come into the presence of God, which is important for us to recognize. We commonly think that now anybody can come into the presence of God. That's not what the torn veil signifies. Only priests could enter into the holy place and only high priests in the holy of holies. So a torn veil represents priests entering into the holy of holies. Which is why it's significant then that the authors of the New Testament affirm the fact that you are a royal priesthood. Right? We have free access into the throne room of God because of the actions of our high priest who has torn the veil and made a way for us to have bold access. And <clears throat> at that same moment, people get resurrected in Jerusalem. No idea. <laughs> Nobody knows what's going on. Uh, no one has a good interpretation on it. Um, Did people actually get resurrected? I think so. I think people actually came back from the dead. I think that Matthew's record of this is an actual factual event that took place. Did these people get resurrected unto a glorified body like Jesus Christ? I do not think so. I think that it would be an affirmation to the work of the resurrection, but not like Jesus' resurrection. So, they probably died just like Lazarus. Jesus, on the other hand, will be resurrected. And at the beginning of the week on Sunday, which is why we worship Jesus on Sunday morning when he rose, Mary comes to the tomb and it is empty. Only come to find that she is to be the one who goes out and tells the disciples uh, what has happened, that Jesus has risen from the dead, and that he will meet them in Galilee. And it has always been an amazing statement of the church that they have held on to the testimony of the women seeing Jesus first. And that the first recounting of his resurrection was from those who would not be technically accepted in the court of law. And that that, that uh, witness of testimony has often been what has been held as the greatest affirmation of the validity of the resurrection of Jesus Christ bodily. It's also interesting to observe that women are the ones who are the only ones acting rightly during the crucifixion scenes or the passion chapters, where you have Mary who is anointing Jesus and wiping him with her uh, hair, where uh, Pilate's wife has has a dream and warns Pilate not to mistreat this man. You have the servant girl who confronts Peter, and Peter is hiding in deception. So it's just an interesting parallel to consider in, in these chapters how women and men are presented in contrast to one another as a observation. Um, I don't have many conclusions off of that. But there you go. Um, The last statement of Jesus to his disciples at the end here is to go out and to preach the gospel to make disciples. And this instruction now comes at the close of the gospel after Jesus' resurrection where he will say to his disciples, "Go go therefore and make disciples of who? All nations. Uh, The Greek word nation is the word ethnos. It is the word that we get the word ethnic from. And ethnos, uh, nations are not border countries. Ethnos are people groups. And Jesus is saying, now go to all the people of the earth. Right? I had sent you previously to the lost sheep of Israel in chapter 10. Now go to all of the people of the earth and tell them the good news that is the resurrection and the, the life of the kingdom of God 
and make disciples so that they might live this out. And this is a wonderful conclusion to the gospel. The presence of Jesus with his disciples to the very end of the age and the call for us to go and to make disciples of all nations. And so let us take this call as we go from this place. As we wrap up SBS, that we would follow in the same footsteps that the disciples had done before. That we would take that commission upon our shoulders as well to go and make disciples of the nations. Make disciples for Jesus, teaching people how to live, passing on the scriptures to them. Modeling it with our lives so that we can um, speak it into others' lives as well. This is, I think, the, the most important thing that Jesus has left, is this call to the Great Commission um, to go out and make more disciples. And for us, uh, for me, it has been my life calling uh, to help people to learn how to make disciples well uh, and to understand the Bible to be able to do that well. And I hope that each one of you would take that up as well, having understood the scriptures, to help people to understand them as well, to pass this on to them, that it wouldn't just be a study that has brought you to this point so you can know God better, but so that you can make God known. Right? And that is really the whole goal of what we're doing and the desire of Jesus as he sent out his disciples, as they came to know him, that they would make him known to the world. And so this is a, a wonderful conclusion, the Gospel of Matthew to SBS and uh, to this season of studying the Bible. Let me pray for us, and we'll be done with the last lecture. Lord, we thank you so much for this gospel. We thank you, Jesus, for the good news that is your resurrection and life, and that we can go and preach you to the nations, Lord. And I pray that you would fill each one of us with a hunger and passion, God, to know the word even better, to make you known, Lord, that our lives, God, would glorify you as we follow you, as we walk with you, Jesus, as we help others to know you better, God, that we would be filled with a passion to know you and to make you known, that that would really be the driving force for us, God, and to be grateful, Lord, as we reflect on your presence with us, that you'll be with us always to the very end of the age, Lord, until we see you face to face. We love you, Jesus. I pray your blessing upon this class, Lord, as they have the next few days to wrap up SBS, Lord, that they would really have a good time to reflect on what you have done in thinking about that. And I pray that this Christmas holiday, Lord, would be an opportunity to think about the wonderful things that you have done in the season, God, mm -hmm. and how you have transformed their lives and laid a foundation in the scriptures, Lord. Would you bless them in Jesus' name?